first of all, we are committed to public service. Um, this is public service week on campus. Um, you might notice people running around with t-shirts that say public service on it or um, in effect, you know, they're, they're volunteering today for public service projects and we've been trying to underscore public service for, for our students. Um, we know we have many public servants in, in the audience here, here today and we have many prospective public servants on campus. We've started a new undergraduate major in public service, the first in the country. So we want to recruit people into the public service, we want to excite them about the public service, and today we want to make sure we take care of them at the end of the, their career in, in terms of, of public service. So, so one of our concerns is the, let's call it the social contract between uh, government and its, um, its employees, its, its public servants, and you know how we honor that that contract and those promises that have been made in return for their commitment over, over time. But, you know, we're equally concerned with um, finances and, and efficiencies. Um, one of our emphases is, is productivity. Um, we, we have a long history, decades long, in terms of how we make government more efficient. In other words, how we better use the limited resources we've been entrusted with. Um, you know, we have a strong group in terms of finance and, and budget, and that's part of our impetus for, for looking at this, because nothing is more important to the finances um, and to the, to the financial health of this state and its localities um, you know, than pensions and, and health benefits. It's a tremendous burden. It's a burden for our neighboring states. It's a burden throughout the country. So I think that today's forum really becomes a model um, for a dialogue and for addressing these questions. You know, third, we're, we're concerned with performance. In other words, how we improve the services we have, how we measure and, and improve those. And um, part of what we're doing is uh, a new project that this forum today um, links with, which is the New Jersey Data Bank. So we're going to launch in the very near future um, a Rutgers Newark New Jersey data bank that will make available data not only on on finances and benefits um, but any of maybe 14 policy areas in in the state so anybody will be able to drill down and look at that and look at rankings as to how New Jersey um, you know compares and we hope rankings within you know within the state as well uh, we're very concerned with rankings um, so people can look for best practices. We we rank the states in terms of e-governance. Um, we want you know we rank them in, in other ways. We're going to have many rankings on this website. So we'll let you know about that in you know in a few weeks, and it will be you know free access. Um, so th those are three of our our emphases: um, you know public service, efficiency, and and finances, and and performance, and um, you know, we welcome you to, to enter into that dialogue with us. Um, we hope that we'll be able to share our projects with you, such as another project on municipal performance measurement systems, um, software that will allow us to actually measure what, what's going on in the various municipalities, and including you know, um, their commitments to, to pensions and health benefits, and the state's commitment to that to that area and the you know prospective load on that that commitment in terms of you know what what we're going to have to pay out in you know in the future. So this this is all of a piece that um, you know to us is public affairs and, and administration and um, you know welcome again to the to this dialogue. I, I think that Rich has picked a, the most timely topic that we have in front of us. Um, in, in the public sector, and we, we look forward to a dynamic discussion today. So thank you. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to welcome you here on behalf of Mr. George Hall and the Hall Institute of Public Policy. Uh, we have been looking at the pension issue for for some four years and put out major reports and you can see them on our website, WW Hall NJ. We regard it as one of the singular important issues, not just for the United States, but for the nation. 
and we're very pleased with what has come out in terms of the Pew Foundation reports that you'll hear about more today, I'm sure. I'm also delighted once again to have the opportunity to work with, with Richard Keevy. He's an incredible. He is one of the truly great public servants in the state of New Jersey. His record is one that is known to all of us who really appreciate the idea of devoting your life to government and understanding government, so we, we salute him. I'm also glad, Dean, to be home again. Um, I was an undergraduate here at Rutgers in Newark, and whenever I come by, it makes me feel good to be able to now be a part of, uh, of, of a major seminar that is taking place in one of uh, the halls here at Rutgers. We didn't have these halls at the time I was there. Uh, we had basically an old beer factory, which was on uh, Rector Street, and we had a, a library, which was a delight, but it was way in the bowels. And whenever it got hot in the summer, you knew the origins of much of the industry of Newark at the time. That's all changed. It's become a modern, beautiful series of campuses up here. And it was a pleasure all the time to come back once again. Thomas Wolf is wrong. You can go home again. So we hope that you have the opportunity today to enjoy the uh, joint presentations that um, Rutgers and the Hall Institute have put together, that you look at the question of pensions, and that most importantly you come away with a sense of the true urgency of the issue. Thank you very much. Okay, we're about ready to go with the main edition here. The way we're going to do it, Susan is going to start off and make presentation, and then uh, we're going to have the state treasurer make the pres his presentation, and then they're both going to come up to field questions and answers together. It's a little different than what the uh, agenda says, but uh, I think collectively we think that'll be the best way. And, and our first speaker is Susan Uran, and Susan is the managing director of the Pew Center of the States, and uh, has issued uh, three, at least three major reports having to do with pension and health benefit issues across the nation. And Susan has lots of experience in that area. In addition to her present role, uh, she served as the uh, policy research and educational evaluation team at the University of Minnesota and also of the House of Representatives in the state of Minnesota. And as you can tell from her bio that's in front of you. She has a doctorate in educational policy and administration at the University of Minnesota. So without further ado, let me welcome Susan up to the podium here. Susan came up last night from Washington, so we appreciate that extra effort. And if I can, all right, you know how to do this, Susan? I was just testing you. Technology has not been my friend the last few days, so that's a little bit of a relief. Thanks, Rich, for the kind introduction, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, for several years now, the Pew Center in the States has been tracking the condition of public pensions and retiree health care systems, and we've been assessing how well state policymakers have been managing them. Our research on this topic is one of the ways that Pew um, helps states deliver the results that Americans expect from government, safe communities, good schools, and a fiscal house that's in order. And these are the things that are really fundamental to American prosperity. Policymakers get these results by making investments in data-driven policy, in programs that show a strong return for taxpayer dollars, and, the choosing, and for choosing solutions that work over the long term as well as in the short term. Now, the growing cost of public um, employee retirement benefits are a significant fiscal challenge for states in the short run and in the long run. Most states' pension and retiree health care costs are rising sharply. They're adding to budget pressures in the states, and they're threatening to crowd out spending for other priorities like education, health care, and infrastructure. But it's more than just a fiscal issue. Retirement benefits are an important tool for recruiting and retaining a workforce that is efficient and effective. And the issue of retirement security writ large is one I think um, that this country is going to really have to start to wrestle with over the next 10 to 15 years as people really take a hard look at what people have set aside for retirement in a system where pensions are increasing a rarity. Um, 
policymakers really need to find a balance, a set of policies that are going to attract and retain the productive workforce that they need, but they need to be able to do that at a sustainable cost to taxpayers. So let me lay out some key facts first to start this conversation, and then at the end of uh, the, the, two, the two speeches, like Rich said, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I'll give you a national overview first based on Pew's research about how states are performing on the important task of managing public sector pensions and retiree health benefits. Um, I'll describe some of the actions we've seen states take, and then I'll talk just very briefly about how New Jersey fits in the national context. And then next I'm going to look at how states are managing their health care, public employee, public retiree health care plans, and talk about those reforms and again where New Jersey fits. So let's look at a few of the troubling numbers that have put this issue on the front burner for most states. At the end of fiscal year 2009, and that's the last day, the last year for which we have um, data for all 50 states, states were $1.26 trillion short of the amount that they needed to pay for retirement benefits, that's both pensions health care, and other benefits for their public um, employees. Now, that's likely a conservative estimate, because what we did when we did that um, assessment was that we used the state's own um, assumptions about the return on investments they were going to get for their pension funds. And overall, that averaged about 8% across the country. So um, you kind of look out at the economy these days and think about the kind of return that you perhaps are expecting on your 401ks. And the lower that return is, the bigger the unfunded liability is, and sometimes startlingly so. Now, that funding gap has serious implications for the public and for policymakers. The bigger the gap, the larger the cost for the taxpayers every single year and for many, many years out into the future. In the last decade, we've seen a very sharp rise in pension costs. So if you look at this chart, what this shows is that um, this is the annual cost or the annual check that states should have written not did write, but should have written, to fund their annual um, required contribution into just their pension funds alone. So back in 2000, states were on the hook for about $27 billion. Um, in 2009, that had increased to $68 billion. That's an increase of 152% in the annual cost of pensions for states. Over that same period of time, state general fund spending went up about 44%. So you begin to see some of the disparities there. Take a look at New Jersey. That same time period, New Jersey's annual bill went up from just about a billion dollars to over four billion. That's an increase of 300 percent. Another kind of startling example is California. The cost went from 1.7 billion in that state to over 12 billion dollars, which is an increase of 644 percent. Now, it's important to recognize that this funding shortfall is not um, purely an outcome of the Great Recession. It certainly made it worse, but it was not the driving cause of it. In 2006, before the recession, states faced a total shortfall of $731 billion. In 2008, and this is before the impact of the Great Recession really had had a chance to register on the balance sheets, uh, the, the funding gap stood at already about a trillion dollars. We saw more of the recession's effect between 2008 and 2009, when the funding shortfall grew about 26 percent to that $1.26 trillion figure. I mentioned earlier. So let's take a look at the $1.26 trillion gap a little bit more closely. The first thing you can see on this slide is the total liability that states have incurred on both the pensions and the health care and other post-retirement benefits side. That's $3.6 trillion is the total liability. Um, the very large circle is pensions, the smaller one is health care. So most of that liability is pensions. Half the shortfall is on the pension side, $659 billion states are short, and the other half, about $604 billion, is on the health care and other benefits side. You put those two together and you get the $1.26 trillion gap. Pensions are certainly the much larger liability, but they're on average across the country about 78% funded, whereas the smaller retiree health care is almost entirely unfunded. Only about 5% nationally of that liability has been set aside by states. Now, while state, um, state retirement fund investments generally earn strong investment returns over the last couple of years, states would be, I think, quite unwise to count on investment returns to get them out of the hole that they are in. The shortfalls are simply too large. And in fact, when the data from fiscal years 2010 and 2011 are out, the national picture is likely to be worse, not better, because most states smooth 
the both the, the losses and the gains that they get that they get from their pension funds over several years. So even as we look at the numbers from 2009 and 2010, the losses have yet to be accounted for that have come from um, the very significant dip they took during the, the Great Recession. For 16 states that have released data for 2010, the average pension fund level declined again from 77% in 2009 to 75% in 2010. So the bad news is not quite over yet. Um, now, the 78% average funding level is a useful number, but it does mask a significant amount of variation in states across the country. So what this, state show, what this map shows is a snapshot of pension funding in 2009, which again is the last year for which we have data for all 50 states. What it shows is that several states have actually responsibly managed their pension funds. The light-colored states on the map have pension funds that are more than 80% funded. Um, for example, you take New York as an example of, of a well-funded pension system. They had a surplus in 2009. North Carolina's pension plans were about 97% funded. But most states are not in such strong shape. If you look at the states in dark blue, 31 of them had pension systems that were less than 80% funded. And that's the threshold that experts recommend that a state be at, at a minimum, to ensure that they have sufficient resources to cover the long-term liability. Now, the reality is that the seeds of this problem have been sowed for well over a decade before the Great Recession, um, as policymakers skipped or shortchanged the amount of the annual contribution that they made to their pension liabilities, and they increased retiree benefits in many cases without really taking a hard look at the price tag or making sure that they had um, both the uh, ability and the willingness to pay for them over the long term. You can see one result of these poor, poor decisions if you take a look at the trajectory of pension funds. In 2000, state pension plans as a whole were in surplus, and more than half the states were fully funded. In 2008, just four states were fully funded, and by 2009, New York and Wisconsin were the only states that had fully funded pension funds. Another interesting way to look at the impact that policy decisions can make is to compare New York and New Jersey. Um, both states had fully funded pension plans in 2002. In every single one of the subsequent years, New Jersey policymakers underfunded their pension funds. Um, they funded at most 60% of what they should have funded, and in some years, far less than that. New York lawmakers made the full annual retired con required contribution into their pension fund every year. So fast forward. Um, Today, New York has a $147 billion liability, that's bigger than New Jersey's. New Jersey's is $135 billion. Um, but New York's annual required contribution, because they don't have an un a huge unfunded liability, is $1.6 billion less than what New Jersey has to pay every year. And that's a very significant difference when it comes to the trade-offs that you're making in terms of funding the other priorities that states have. For example, New York increased K-12 school funding by $1.7 billion. Um, and New Jersey cut education by more than half a billion dollars. So what can state policymakers do to address these challenges? What this slide shows is the types and the sort of policy reform activity that we've seen across the country since 2001. Since some states have gone and enacted reforms several times, this is not the number of states. Keep in mind, we'll get to that in a minute, but this is the number of actual reforms that we've seen. The, uh, the reforms that are in, um, the reforms that, uh, there are really two types of reforms that we've seen. One is that they tend to increase employee contributions. The other is that they cut benefits, or they do both. So you can see the significant increase in activity that we've seen since 2001. Um, you can see that states are, in many cases, doing both, in, in requiring employees to contribute more and cutting benefits. Um, we've seen 103 total reforms over the last 10 years in terms of pensions. And those reforms happen pretty much everywhere. So you look at this map. Any state that has a color has done one or the other or both in terms of pension reforms. There's been a lot of activity just in the last few years. In 2010, 19 states reduced benefits for newly hired employees or required their employees to pay more out of their own pocket toward their retirement. In 2011, 21 states enacted one or both of those. Now, there's been um, a little recent action on promoting private-style 401k style plans. Um, a few states are talking about switching to hybrid versions of that, uh, sometimes combining plans for new hires that combine aspects of defined benefit and defined contribution plans. In a hybrid plan, an employee will get a reduced defined benefit combined with some kind of a defined contribution, and that will shift some of the fiscal risk from the state to the employee. 
Utah now has one in place, and Rhode Island's um, treasurer is, I believe, poised to introduce one, a proposal for one in the next legislative session. Um, but this is, not, uh, this is not something that a whole lot of states are considering. Now, states aren't going to see dramatic, in, dramatic decreases in costs from these kinds of, of pension changes. But if you take a look at it over time, even small changes can have a very significant impact. In 1989, Minnesota put in place an, a requirement that raised the retirement age by one year for new hires. Over the last two decades, Minnesota has saved about $650 million by that one change alone. So small changes over time do add up. And many of New Jersey's reforms fall in line with the kind of changes we're seeing across the country. New Jersey increased employee contributions for pensions. Since 2025, states have done that, um, and 11 states have done it more than once. In 2010, five states, including California, did so, and nine states did so in 2011. Now, one reason that states are pursuing that kind of reform is that that's something that they have the ability to change for current employees. So significant savings can show up faster than change um, to, pe to, pension benefit uh, to pension benefits. Uh, they almost, those kinds of changes almost always affect only newly hired employees and have virtually no impact on the current liability that the state has. New Jersey also raised the retirement age for new hires, a very common move for states looking to rein in their costs. Um, California, Illinois, New York, and Texas have all raised retirement ages for new hires since 2009. Um, Illinois sort of led the way to going all the way up to age 67 for retirement, and several other states have followed suit. New Jersey's suspension of cost of living increases for current employees, uh, for current retirees, is a far less common step. Uh, Colorado, Minnesota, and South Dakota did likewise. Um, all three of those states uh, are in litigation over those. Similar lawsuits have been filed here in New Jersey. Now, the lower courts have ruled in favor of the state in both Colorado and Minnesota, but those decisions are being appealed. And the, the final decisions um, on both of those cases are unlikely, uh, unlikely to be resolved for several years to come. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very slow and kind of painful way to move in this direction, and it's probably discouraged other states from following. But it is something that we are seeing. And depending on how the court rules, that may change the playing field for those kinds of changes as well. But the problem isn't just pensions. Um, it's, we think it's really important to talk about pensions and retiree health care benefits. They can be changed more easily than pensions, but both are bills that are going to be coming due eventually. And especially when a state makes substantial promises to its retirees, it's fiscally prudent to set aside money each year to, to, to also pay for the long-term liabilities on the health care side, because investment gains can help manage the cost to taxpayers and employees. So when we look at retiree health care benefits, we also see cause for great return. So I'm going to go back to this slide. Remember that employee health care benefits is a much smaller liability, um, but there, are, there is a uh, very significant 95% of that is unfunded. As this state shows, 19 states had nothing saved for their health care, um, health care and other benefits they promised their retirees. Those are the states in white. And just seven states had more than 25% of their total liability covered which means is that a lot of states are dealing with their health care costs for retirees on a pay-as-you-go basis. Now, this is fine if the state has not really um, made significant promises and has a relatively small liability. But for states that have incurred a very significant liability over a long term, the pay-as-you-go um, approach is going to be quite challenging, particularly in years to come as the baby boomers move into retirement and as health care costs continue to climb. So take a look at New Jersey again. The liability on the New Jersey side is just a little bit over $66 billion. In New York, it's $56 billion. Um, in Illinois, it's about $44 billion. So maybe manageable now, but in years to come, maybe a, a far more significant problem. Again, states are taking action on this front. It's less common than it is on the pension front, but we are seeing growing policy activity. Um, Last year, seven states made changes to how they structure uh, their health care benefits for states. They either increased employee contributions, re reduced benefits, established a trust fund, or did some combination of all three. In 2010, New Jersey increased employee contributions toward retiree health care, and they tightened eligibility, re eligibility requirements. In 2011, employee contribution rates to pay for health care were further increased. Now, a new issue that's moved, um, that's emerged is a move by states to enact limits on employees' rights to collectively bargain. This was done in Wisconsin and Ohio. Here in New Jersey, the state moved to eliminate its employees' right to bargain collectively on retiree health care benefits. Since this is a relatively new approach, 
there's not a lot of evidence available to say whether such restrictions actually produce savings or contribute to a healthier state retirement over the long term, but it's certainly something that folks are going to be taking a hard look at. So at the end of the day, it's not just about designing a retirement system that's sustainable on paper. States have to also have the fiscal discipline to pay for the benefits agreed to, because without fiscal discipline, there is nothing that's sustainable. That discipline is sorely needed in New Jersey. In 2009, New Jersey paid less than a third of the amount that it needed to fund the retirement obligations over the long term. And unfortunately, New Jersey has lots of company when it comes to this. Um, Alaska, Arizona, Florida, Idaho, and Nebraska were the only states that paid their full annual bills for both pensions and retiree health care in 2009. So clearly, policymakers in many states are taking a hard look at, uh, over, at how they manage or fail to manage their considerable costs for public employee benefits and pensions. And even in states like New York and Wisconsin, where the pension benefits are actually quite well funded, um, governors are taking a very hard look at the size of the liabilities and whether that's a system that is sustainable over the long term for the state. It's important to step back and realize that this challenge has to be set within a larger national debate that really does begin to identify what does retirement security mean in this country and what are the, the, the sort of the paths that we are going to take to achieve it. The balance that policymakers strike on the public workforce and its costs is going to affect the employee's retirement security. I think many people are surprised to learn that about 6 million state and local public employees, or about one in four, are not covered by Social Security. Their retirement benefits depend very largely on the pensions uh, that are offered through their government employers. Factors like this need to be better understood as the search for solutions across the country continues. As policymakers and the public have come to grasp the scope of this crisis, we've seen action across almost all of the 50 states. But they have a long way to go before they shore up their retirement systems. And as they do so, they're going to be asking some key questions. What is the kind of system that is fiscally sustainable for our state? And it will vary from state to state. How do we ensure the fiscal discipline that we need to maintain that system? How will changes in the structure of pensions and health care plans affect our ability to recruit and retain the kind of workforce that we need? These are exactly the questions that New Jersey has begun to wrestle with and needs to resolve in order to fix its problems. We've been working on research for this for about the last five years. We're going to continue to do so, and we're very excited about being as much help as we can to New Jersey and other states as you move forward here. And if you are interested in the work that we have coming out, I'd encourage you to go to our website. Uh, it's www.pewcenterandthestates.org. You can sign up for our e-newsletter. You can pick just pensions if you want, and you won't get deluged, and we'd be delighted to share our work with you. Um, so thanks very much for the invitation, and I'll be happy to answer questions in a bit. Thank you, Susan. And uh, our next speaker... My privilege to introduce the State Treasurer of New Jersey, Andrew Aristoff. Andrew uh, has been the State Treasurer for the past, uh, since January 2010, and in that capacity, unlike any other State Treasurer in the United States, has full responsibility over all fiscal issues of the state, whether it is budget or accounting, pensions, financing, everything is under the control of the New Jersey State Treasurer. Uh, before coming to New Jersey, Andrew served as the Commissioner of New York State Department of Taxation and Finance. He was the Commissioner of Finance in the City of New York, and he was also elected three times to the City of New York City Council. So Andrew has been on both sides of the executive and legislative arena, and it's uh, my privilege to uh, introduce to you the State Treasurer. Andrew, please. Thank you, Rich. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Um, before I get into my formal remarks, I just want to make a, a, a few uh, housekeeping comments. First, I want to thank uh, Dean Holzer and, and Rich Keevy and, and Rutgers and the Hall Institute for supporting this event today. I think this is extremely important to the public dialogue uh, here in New Jersey and beyond. I also want to acknowledge uh, a few people in the audience today who have played a key role in um, helping to achieve pensions and health benefits reform here in New Jersey. Um, specifically, I'd like to point out that my chief of staff, Regina Egea, is in the audience. Um, she uh, has uh, the, the, she's basically the field general of um, pensions and health benefits reform. And for her, for her sins, as a thank you for all of her work 
um, on the reform package. She is now co-chairing the health benefits uh, plan design uh, committees, um, and I'm sure you're having a lot of fun with that um, as, we, as we move forward. I also want to recognize Sonia Das uh, from the uh, Majority Office of the State Senate. Where are you, Sonia? Um, Sonia played a very uh, important role um, as we uh, hammered out the details of these proposals, she representing the, um, the President uh, of the Senate, and I want to thank you for your support and for your, um, your contributions to a uh, successful reform effort. And then finally, I want to recognize and thank uh, Assemblyman O'Scanlan. Uh, Declan was a, a key behind-the-scenes player uh, throughout the process, uh, and we valued your, your input, your your advice and, and the occasional uh, observation that we may or may not have uh, welcomed, you know, when, you, when you've sort of injected a certain dose of reality to the discussion from time to time, and, and that's always incredibly valuable. Uh, so thank you, Declan, for, for helping to make this um, a reality. Um, my, my remarks are going to be a little bit more tactical, if you will, um, and, and, and you'll forgive me, a little bit more political, reflecting my status as a recovering politician from New York. Um, but I, I know this is a demanding and well-informed audience, and, and I, I just ask for your sufferance uh, as I make it through this presentation, and then we can get into questions and answers uh, a little bit later. Now, um, the first thing I need to do is, ah, yes. So lest we all forget, um, there is a larger context at work here. Um, under Governor Christie, um, we've tried to emphasize uh, a commitment to spending, spending discipline and, and fiscal responsibility on, on all fronts. Um, as, you, as you are well aware, we've um, had to balance three budgets in a row, uh, including one that we inherited upon taking office, uh, we've held the line on spending here in New Jersey. Um, we've done so without enacting any new uh, broad-based tax increases, and in fact, the current fiscal uh, year's budget includes about $185 million of uh, pro-growth business-oriented tax cuts. We've also um, reduced the risk profile of the state's debt. Um, this is something that really hasn't gotten a lot of attention, um, but through a series of transactions, we've reduced our exposure to interest rate, interest rate swap um, uh, uh, and, and, and associated letters of credit um, by about $1.3 billion. And I think that um, augurs well for the future um, of, of, our, uh, of, our, of our debt structure. Um, and we've also, of course, achieved uh, some no notable bipartisan success working with the legislature um, to achieve property tax reform first in, in the form of a, a levy cap at 2% and, of course, the landmark pensions and benefits reform. Now, speaking of uh, pensions and benefits, I mean, the problem um, I'm sure is familiar to all of you. Um, as Susan noted, um, we were faced with an unfunded liability of $120 billion um, at the beginning of this process, uh, $54 billion or so for state and local pensions, and about $67 billion for post-retirement uh, medical benefits. Um, the actuarially required or recommended uh, contribution uh, for pension payments was projected uh, to reach about $13 billion a year by 2041, because we, we used a sort of a 30-year study period. Um, but, but clearly, um, the, the uh, pension contributions were uh, spiraling um, out of control. Um, and uh, as you probably appreciate, New Jersey spends about $4.3 billion a year on public employee and retiree health care costs. And those costs were expected um, to increase by about 40% over the next four years. And just to put this in perspective, um, as a percentage of the state budget, the, um, those, those costs have, have doubled um, since 2001. So clearly we're on a, uh, a challenging tra trajectory. Uh, the, uh, the reforms themselves, I think, are notable uh, for many reasons. First of all, um, they reflect a bipartisan achievement. Um, uh, and they do uh, help preserve pension security uh, for current and future retirees here. Um, and the, the net of it is we calculated about $122 billion in pensions and uh, pension contribution savings over the next 30 years, um, almost $80 billion for state government, but notably um, for about $43 billion for local governments, and that will come uh, as a major benefit for local uh, governments uh, and struggling local taxpayers. On the health benefits side, um, we project that the uh, 
that, that the, uh, the final agreement will save um, about $1.4 billion for the state over the next uh, 10 years and about $1.6 billion um, for local governments. Again, uh, a major benefit for local taxpayers who are um, under great stress here in New Jersey. Um, the immediate benefits of the reforms uh, will be that we, we, by virtue of the reforms themselves, we can um, cut the anticipated pension contribution um, in fiscal 12 by about $22 million. Now, um, uh, informed observers will note that that still represents only one-seventh of the ARC payment or contribution. Um, nevertheless, um, it does represent some immediate benefit uh, under the current statutory structure. Um, we also expect to be able to pass an additional $43 million in savings on through to local governments. And I just listed a few of the local governments that will be seeing some benefits in, in fiscal 12. And those, that's real money uh, by anyone's uh, estimation. Um, the, the details of the deal, I, I think, are well known, but let me just review very briefly. Um, we increased contribution rates under um, the various systems. Those uh, will take uh, effect this month of October. Um, we also have new health benefit contribution rates that take effect this month. Uh, most state workers, however, and local workers, will probably not see a change uh, during the first year because the new rates, uh, which reflect a switch from a percentage of salary to a percentage of premium uh, paradigm, will be lower than the 1.5% uh, of salary um, they are now, they're now paying. Um, so, but over the four years, as we phase in um, the, the reforms, they will begin to see um, a fairly dramatic impact. Um, I should point out that the Pensions and Benefits Division has, has posted a simple health benefits calculator um, for our retirees or members um, so, that, so that people gain greater uh, visibility into what's, what's likely to happen. Um, just a few charts. Um, this is the projected, uh, projected state pension contributions. Um, absent reform is the red, of course. Um, and then under reform, uh, you can see a significant flattening out. Now, um, this, this first period of, uh, of uh, uh, about six, seven years reflects the fact that we're now living under a statutory framework which has us um, phasing in to a full ARC payment over seven years, beginning this year and then next year it'll be two sevenths and three sevenths and so forth. And so essentially, as, as uh, observers will note, we're still losing ground um, in each of the next six years uh, before we finally get to the full ARC payment um, and then you can see some dramatic progress. Um, this is um, the state and local combined, uh, a similar kind of effect. Um, you will see that uh, um, essentially we reach full funding as of 2010 um, uh, at, at the local level, um, and that's why there's a dip off at the end of the projection under blue. Um, funded ratios. Again, we're losing ground over the next few years. We recognize that. Um, but then after that phase in of the full ARC payment, we'll be uh, realizing some steady, steady improvement um, and getting us up and over the 80% at risk level, which we feel um, represents a consensus view of, of what's appropriate and uh, sustainable. And again, I uh, wanted to present state and local in combination and a very similar uh, path forward. Okay, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about what different states are doing and how did they get there and, and what went into this. And this is where I kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, ramble off into the tactical weeds, if you will. Um, clearly, this was a product of compromise. As I said, it was a bipartisan achievement. Um, and that meant a lot of dialogue, a lot of negotiation over a long, long period of time. And, and this just gives you a snapshot of the, 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 the impact of you know, the negotiation uh, uh, and, and the process. Um, so the previous law for PERS was 5.5%. Um, governor had originally proposed 8.5%. And at the end, we settled on 6.5%, moving up to 7.5% over seven years. The same story um, could be said about TPAF. 
Um, we did end up with a slightly, you know, with higher contribution rates in respect of PFRS and SPRS uh, than the governor had originally proposed. And I'm sure our, our friends uh, in the judiciary are very pleased with the compromise uh, proposal uh, for them. But if you look at what I call the sort of the, the pension equivalent of the fair box uh, coverage ratio, uh, that does not, um, it, it's by no means uh, unjustified. Um, again, uh, just to show you sort of the warp and woof of the negotiation process, um, we had originally proposed uh, rolling back the 9% um, uh, pension enhancement that was adopted by um, uh, the legislature and the governor back in 2001. Uh, that did not move forward. Um, we did, however, um, propose and, and we saw through a suspension of cost of living increases. Um, we did not achieve the, um, the proposal to extend the period for calculating pensions for active members. I think this is uh, uh, unfortunate um, because I still think the system is subject to a certain amount of gaming. Um, we, uh, we did uh, succeed in boosting the normal retirement age, um, but only for new hires. Um, and um, we also were able to do some changes on uh, early retirement with respect to new hires only. I think these are issues that are going to come, come back around, um, and we'll speak to that in a few minutes. Um, and then finally, um, we had originally proposed some changes to the disability pension uh, system and, and standards, and those were not adopted as part of this package. I have a feeling, however, that we're going to be continuing to talk about that in the years ahead. So um, on the health benefits side, um, we did achieve a very, very significant um, change. I think a, a, the, the single most important thing that happened on the health benefit side was um, that we were able uh, to switch from a percentage of salary um, structure or scheme to a percentage of a premium. And as everybody here will appreciate, that essentially puts the, the member employee on the same side uh, or in alignment in terms of interests with the employer. And going forward, I think this will be seen in the future as the single most important accomplishment um, of, the, uh, of the health benefits reform. Um, we are going to be um, moving to roughly 20 percent uh, overall. Um, we had originally proposed a, about a 30 percent cost share uh, for our employees, which is still um, fairly generous if you look at uh, other public and, and private systems. Uh, but as a function of negotiation, we wound up with a sliding scale um, with an overall um, share of about 20%, uh, although at the very high end, you'll see 35%, and of course, much lower contribution levels at the, at the lower end. Um, and then finally, um, we will uh, move forward with the governor's proposal to, to give our workers, our members, more health benefit options. Um, so they will have, when we... Um, when we enter the open enrollment period, they'll have um, at least three different options to choose from with four different groupings, you know, coverage uh, uh, structures. Plus, they'll have a, um, a high deductible HSA uh, option available um, to them. So, so that will move forward, and we think that that is appropriate health care uh, policy. Now, um, this is my favorite diagram that you can't possibly read. Um, from your seats, but this shows you, th this fan chart essentially shows you the, the sliding scale contributions under health care reform. So um, at the very high end, uh, you know, the, the, um, you can see that the, the contribution shares will uh, touch 35 percent, and of course, the, uh, at the very low end of the salary scale, uh, the contribution amounts will be relatively low, uh, but all will increase over the next four years. So, um, you know, let, let me just speak a little bit to sort of the tactical approach. And I hope, you know, I, I hope that uh, uh, this doesn't make it into the Star Ledger tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I, I, people have asked me and, and others in the administration, so, so how did this happen? Um, and and maybe, maybe I should just offer up a, a few observations uh, that may, may or may not be tact, um, portable to other um, jurisdictions. Uh, first you got to take the first step. You have to have actually put a proposal out. Um, and that's what we did last September. Um, 
and predict, you know, predictably, uh, we drew a lot of heat. You know, we, the governor came out with his, uh, his, his proposals, and immediately the battle was joined. Um, but um, we saw from the tenor of that battle that there were lots of different um, stakeholders who had opinions, um, and, and we knew that it was the only, only way to sort of get the ball rolling was to actually be willing to take, the, take, take that public step and actually commit to a specific reform package. Um, then the governor did um, what he does so very, very well, and that is take the case to the public. Um, I mean, no one could deny the magnitude of the problem. Um, you know, as the Pew Charitable Trusts have made absolutely clear all across the country for several years now, um, New Jersey and almost every other state face a very, very um, a significant challenge, um, and one that no one could just, just dismiss as a non-issue. Um, but the governor went beyond just sort of stating the obvious. He, he was consistent and persuasive. He, he went to town halls. Um, and he spoke about pensions and health reforms in terms that were accessible uh, to his audience and, and to uh, his constituents here in New Jersey. Um, clearly, a search for pro common ground is, is critical. It's an obvious point, of course. But um, you know, one of the first things we did was try to take an inventory of our points of agreement with the other stakeholders um, who were active in the issue. Now, um, the Senate president came out with a uh, a package, his own reform proposals, shortly after the governor. Um, and we immediately reviewed that very closely, and we found, uh, much to our, uh, our, our pleasant surprise, that he had embraced conceptually the idea of, uh, of premium share, um, which we thought, we, we frankly hadn't anticipated that there would be interest in pursuing that, because we knew, having uh, participated in the 2010 reform battles and, and just based on anecdotes from, um, uh, from previous years, we, we, we thought that there would be a, a, a huge resistance to the idea of moving off a percentage salary, percent of salary to a percentage of a premium uh, paradigm. And uh, so that was, that was a, a, a wonderful sort of shot in the arm because uh, then we knew we had something to talk about uh, and we, we, we thought that there would be somewhere an agreement. Um, ahead of us. Um, you've also got to, uh, and this is not just in, in legislative negotiation, but you've, in, I think in life you've got to anticipate uh, and understand um, your negotiating partners' um, policy objectives or their political objectives um, and try to um, not, you know, empathize may or may not be the right word, but the point is you've got to understand what they're dealing with so that you can be responsive in, and helpful if you possibly can while remaining true to your own uh, policy uh, priorities and objectives. Um, so, um, for instance, we knew um, that uh, many of the stakeholders involved in this debate were very, very anxious about um, the, the idea of suspending cost of living adjustments um, and, and, and the perception that we would be, we would be um, somehow constraining plan design going forward. And, um, we also knew that there would be stakeholders, many of them local governments, who would be very concerned um, about uh, flexibility and autonomy at the local level. And I, I wanted to just take a few moments in the next slides to talk about uh, how these issues were addressed. So, um, for first thing to do, you know, you've got to anticipate the possibility of legal challenge. We were aware of the uh, of, of the uh, reforms that have been challenged in Minnesota and Colorado and elsewhere. Um, and, and we were painfully or, you know, uh, realistically aware that, um, you know, achieving legislative passage and a gubernatorial signature is not the end of the road by any means. Um, and, and so as part of the discussion, um, we came up with this target funding ratio uh, concept, which we hoped would not only buttress our legal position, but also make it a little bit easier for our partners um, to reach agreement with us. And the idea was to provide an objective standard um, that would essentially um, maintain the reality of, 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 of autonomy and flexibility going forward within a carefully constrained um, structure. Um, so specifically, um, the legislation 
uh, call for the creation of plan design committees uh, for each of the pension systems. Um, and they would have equal labor management representation. Um, and, and, and so this was trying to be responsive to what we knew would be some concern um, on behalf of the unions um, that they, they wanted greater, greater uh, involvement in uh, policy making with respect to the pension and, and pension plan design. So the target funding ratio concept is, is fairly simple. Um, basically, we're saying that if your funding ratio is at or above the target funded ratio, um, then the committees essentially will have the power to make plan design adjustments, including the restoration of COLAs, if, if that's uh, deemed appropriate, S provided, of course, that, um, that those adjustments don't take um, the, the funds below the target fund ratio um, at any time within the next 30 years. So um, essentially, this puts gives them autonomy, but it constrains the plan design committees in such a way as to, as to essentially guarantee that once we reach 80%, uh, again, a, a fairly well um, accepted standard of, of soundness, um, once we get to 80%, then they're going to stay there. And, you know, they can, they can, they, they can make adjustments, they can, they can make trade-offs between contributions and colas or retirement, whatever it is, um, but they will have to, they can't um, institute changes that, from an actuarial perspective, take the, uh, the, the, the plan below 80% within the next 30 years. And I think, I think that's really an appropriate uh, mechanism um, and, and preserves the, the, the reality of some autonomy um, and, and, and the reality of input from our members and, and, uh, um, and the unions as well. So um, local government, um, a different set of dynamics. Um, as, you, as you probably know, uh, New Jersey has this mild tradition of home rule. Um, and uh, uh, our local governments are not required or mandated to use the state health benefits uh, plan, uh, although many of them do. Um, and so the challenge was here, how do we avoid a situation where we have, um, uh, you know, towns who don't choose to participate um, undermining the, the reforms that we've just achieved at the state level? Um, and, but how do we do it without weakening local autonomy? So the solution was to, to give localities flexibility. Uh, if they're outside the state health benefits plan, they have the flexibility to negotiate different benefits, including different, presumably different contribution levels, uh, if they can certify savings equal or greater than would be realized under the state health benefits plan contribution scheme. So that just says to localities, look, if you can do it better, you can negotiate with your unions and, and, and come up with an alternative package that at least keeps you uh, at the same status uh, as the state health benefits plan, have at it be our incubator of reform and innovation. Um, and again, this preserves a measure of autonomy, um, but creates a, at least a, a, a sort of a backstop, which we think will help local governments resist um, pressure of various kinds to give away the store. So some lessons learned. Um, again, this is from a recovering politician, so this is all to be taken with a grain of salt. but. Um, you know, it's still possible to do some big things in government. Um, occasionally, I get very frustrated and, and um, uh, a little bit wistful uh, when I talk to my father, who was involved in the 1960s in municipal government in New York, when, you know, the attitude was, well, why can't we do that? Let's try it, you know, go for it. Uh, now, of course, um, you know, we're, we're, we've been beaten into submission so that, so that our expectations of what government can accomplish um, have been have been constrained, to say the least. So, but it's still possible every now and then to do some big things. Um, you've got to be open to compromise. Um, and I think um, as part of that, you've got to understand that victory shouldn't and can't be zero sum, uh, and it's never permanent. I mean, this is government. This is policy making. It's a continuous stream. At least that's my conception of it. Um, this is the third point is the single most important point for me as a, um, a government administrator and, a, and a sort of a, a groupie of government uh, uh, public administration, 
Um, don't underestimate the need for decision analytics. Um, uh, we really suffered a paucity of decision analytics throughout this process. Um, we, uh, we're, we were dealing with you know, pensions and health benefits reform um, involved multiple, dozens of independent variables, right? You know, contribution limits, internal rate of return, actuarial methods, accounting methods, you name it. Everything's adjustable. And um, luckily, we had consultants available to us uh, and actuaries who were able to, to, to crunch the numbers um, and run these what-if scenarios. And, you know, this began over, over the summer, more than a year ago, as we were modeling different options for the government, uh, governor's consideration. And it continued. Um, it fluctuated, of course, with, with the sort of pace of negotiation. But um, it, was, it, was, um, it was an overwhelming need for this kind of decision analytics. And um, this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine, um, but I think, um, I, I think this is not widely under, understood or appreciated outside of government. Um, that that we don't typically have access to the kind of decision analytics that I think are appropriate to making these major, major decisions. Um, and in fact, uh, if I might be so bold, um, as other states contemplate making some changes and, and uh, doing what we did, um, I hope that somebody somewhere will decide to make a gazillion dollars by build, building a decision engine um, to analyze um, uh, pension reform options and, and health benefits reform options. So when I asked for this at the beginning of, of our process about 14 months ago, and I was told firmly um, such, a, such an engine doesn't exist. I was thinking, you know, why can't we build a mortgage calculator that, you know, has a few other variables and we can plug in the IRR and the, you know, the, the open uh, amortization period and, you know, all these things. And I was told, of course, by consultants who wouldn't have benefited from the availability of such a, a, a decision uh, tool uh, that it didn't exist. But somebody, somebody should be aware that there's an opportunity out there, um, and it's not just limited to pensions and health benefits. And then, you know, finally, um, uh, be realistic uh, and anticipate the fact that there will be a, a next time. Um, pensions and health benefits reform will come back. Uh, it's, it's not done um, forever by any means. Um, as Susan noted, there are many, many outstanding issues for New Jersey as well as other jurisdictions across the country. Um, and um, uh, I know that this will be a continuing conversation. But that's OK. It helps me sleep at night knowing, because otherwise, um, it would be very hard to make a deal if, 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 if you weren't comfortable um, that, in fact, um, uh, there would be an opportunity at some point to revisit these issues and make further progress down the road. So with that, let me uh, thank you for your time and your patience and your understanding. Right, Susan's going to come up and join Andrew. And uh, we welcome questions from the audience. Unfortunately, I don't see a microphone here. So you're going to have to shout it out. All right. Um, this is something we actually started looking at about six months ago because there are very few states, if any, across the country that are taking a look beyond anything beyond their sort of projected internal rates of return. That's become a real sort of flashpoint and focal point of discussion. But these other assumptions, and that's just one of them, can drive huge um, shifts over time. And, and I think this is something we are hoping to kind of do some research on um, when we start looking much more deeply into plan design because I think the conversation now that the state have figured out that this is a problem, and now that they've done the first or second round of reform, now the, the detailed discussions about exactly what the plan design should be and what history has shown and what the future is likely to be in the new normal, I think, is going to be, a, it's going to be the third and fourth round of reform. So I think you will start to see that um, in, the, in the next three to five years. Let me chip in, too, because I know in your report, Susan, you ran a computation, you ran a computation that said, well, suppose it wasn't 8.3%. Mm -hmm. which was the average in the country. I think New Jersey uses 8.3. And you use a percentage that corporations use, which I think was 4.4%, and it would exponentially increase the state's commitment. Mm -hmm. Now, presumably, it would be offset a little bit by your other point, that is that the, interest, the rate of increase for employee salaries may be too high. 
But it's not just one part of the equation, as both of the panelists spoke. You've got to look at both sides of the equations. My guess is it would far offset the fact that if you lowered the assumption for growth of salaries of employees, but, it, but also lowered the interest rate assumption, you'd be even worse off. But there are kind of micro issues that the Treasurer suggested that will be continued to be looked at. Well, I, I mean, I'll give you another issue. I, I mean, we, we are moving from a 30-year open amortization period to a 20-year um, open amortization period, but the transition will be essentially closed amortization moving from 30 to 20. And, and um, you know, I guess, you know, only actuaries can really understand what the mechanics are of this, but, but it, it, it was just mind-numbing um, to, to try to understand the impact of any one of these individual variables on the total picture and, and you know and because a policymaker needs to understand okay so how does this contribute to the overall picture it's very frustrating not to have visibility into that next question data when it comes to pensions is incredibly complicated and and difficult when you're trying to go across the 50 states which is what we're trying to do i think you're absolutely right things have changed between 09 and 11. Um, we had the 16 states that had 2010 data that are still showing drops you've got the smoothing challenge because you've got the actual numbers and then the sort of three or five years before and after that states are using um, so I think it is it is very challenging to try to make pensions policy legislation looking at single snapshot points in time. I think you really do have to kind of look at trends over time, looking at economic trends, looking at actuarial trends. It's, so I think you know, it is, it is, you wouldn't want to look at one years of data, you would, you would want to look at several years of data. I, I would agree, I mean, and our, New Jersey's um, recent experience, I think, uh, buttresses Susan's point. The, the, the statute provides a three-year smoothing, and I think that's, that's um, appropriate. Um, but in fact, New Jersey has, um, has had experience not too long ago with marking to market in order to basically um, you know, grab the benefit of a, of a temporary um, roll-up or increase in, in uh, asset uh, values, which, which I think we've, we've come to regret. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, three years, I would even consider something longer. Um, we're still phasing in, um, from an actuarial standpoint, um, the reduction in, in uh, investment uh, values uh, that the state incurred in 2008. Uh, so they're still being um, factored into the calculation. So the fact that we had a really good le year last year, 18%, more or less, um, in the pension funds uh, for the fiscal year ending June 30, um, that's great. Um, but it, it shouldn't we shouldn't be um, sort of lured into the um, the the you know the the the, the mistake of, of assuming we're going to be able to sustain that uh, going forward. Um, and and so I think a smoothing approach is appropriate. Well, I just like the other gentleman. We'll come back to you if there's no more questions. If that's okay. In general, um, I think states have not gotten that far in the conversation. I think it is a really important next step, but but primarily what they're looking at is the impact on the state budget. It is a fiscal issue. Um, they have not broadened it out to think about either sort of the impact on recruiting and retaining the workforce necessarily or on retirement security more broadly. And I think all three of those things need to be considered. But at this point, the conversation is primarily a fiscal one. And my guess is they will be looking at the impact on the annual contribution that's required. And that's going to be the short-term measure of success. I, I agree. Let me go over this one first. The, the target-funded ratio... Um, We'll start at 75% and we'll move up incrementally to 80% for all the systems over the next seven years. Um, and, and essentially all that means is that if a fund now is at or above 75% funded, um, then a plan design committee will come into being and will have the autonomy that I described to change some elements of plan design. Um, then next year, um, that will in that 75 level will I increase to you know just below 76 percent. 
um, to reflect the one seventh um, increase in in the threshold. Uh, and again, the the idea, the mechanism of moving from seventy five to eighty percent is designed essentially to to um, to push systems up into the eighty percent uh, without penalizing systems that have um, are on a on a relatively sound footing um, right now, and but essentially to ensure that they do no harm between now and when they get to 80%. That, that's the mechanism. It, it assumes that the state will make the one-seventh, uh, it'll make the contributions under the existing one-seventh law. Um, but the, the actual funded ratio for each of the systems will be uh, a, a function not only of contributions but investment results um, and uh, some other factors over the next few years. So. Um, if I may, yeah. I think it works something like this. If we're at one seventh now, let's call it around five hundred million dollars. When we hit seven sevenths, yeah, which will be seven years from now, it'll be something like five point five billion dollars. Yeah, and then the commitment is that they, the state, will fund it, whatever the actuary says beyond that. Right, but that's different than talking about the mechanics of the of the TFR. Um, the TFR just basically represents the threshold for this autonomy on plan design, and um, yeah, there there may be funds that are ch have this autonomy for one year and then dip below it based upon uh, investment results uh, for a couple of years, and and so we'll see what happens. As you saw, you know the the expectation is that the increased contribution um, levels. And the other changes that we made, the other reforms, will over time lift all of the funds above 80 percent over, over time, though. It'll take some decades. If the state makes its commitment for yeah. 77 yeah. and then funds it from then on, in the year 30 years from now, it'll be at 80 percent? Or less. Or less. Yeah. If all, if, so you're not going to go back and put money back. As you know, the governor uh, signed the one seventh contribution law last year in March of 2010, um, and and I think that's a, a, a firm commitment. Um, we have funded the um, the uh, the payment, uh, the required payment for fiscal 12, and my expectation is that we'll do so in 13 and beyond. Um, I don't know how else to give you any 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 comfort and. Um, other than to point out that um, you know we have followed through on what we said we would do, um, and, and I think frankly um, there are external stakeholders who are will continue to hold our feet to the fire. Um, you know you'll be hearing later uh, from somebody from, uh, uh, at Fitch, um, you know who has uh, uh, certainly an interest in following events here in New Jersey very closely. Um, um, so there, there are lots of people out there who are watching us and making sure um, that we follow through on the commitment. Um, other than that, I'm not quite sure what legal mechanism there is. No, I, I think the answer is appropriate. The question is very appropriate. It is the discipline of putting the money in the budget. Yeah. And if I may, that is going to be a big issue. If you go out to the five years from now or six years from now, and you've gone from zero appropriation for pensions, now up to $5 billion of appropriation, something, something else is going to give, right, by definition. <laughs> Other questions? There is a constitutional requirement that we balance the budget. Um, but what I think is notable is the fact that we did it uh, here in New Jersey without uh, any broad-based tax increases, um, and we did it um, at the same time that we began investing in tax cuts and other changes to make New Jersey more more competitive. So I think that is notable. Uh, it's also notable that we were uh, in a position uh, to have to clean up a, a, a widening uh, gap or fiscal mess left to us by the prior administration. Clearly the economy um, has been a challenge all the way through, um, but uh, the governor made some very, very tough decisions, took a lot of heat. Um, for making those decisions, but I think we're in better stead right now going forward. As to the as to the uh, the, the, the pension debate, I mean, I'll take full responsibility. Um, we gave the governor the facts. The facts are that um, the current pension system, or uh, the you know, prior to reform, was unsustainable by I think any reasonable uh, measure. 
um, and um, to, to, to sort of act as if um, we could have just um, somehow grown our way out of this or uh, continued to bump along, I, I think would have done a disservice to the people in New Jersey and to the dialogue. I mean, we had to kind of face up to this. It's unsustainable um, to, to move forward and irresponsible, I think, to move forward without addressing these problems. And I, I'm proud to work with a governor who has, frankly, the uh, you know, the, the, the will and the desire and the leadership capacity to take this on. Yeah, and I think those observations are buttressed by uh, Susan's macro view of the pension systems in the country. I mean, this isn't just New Jersey saying they have a problem. It's reputable other entities that look at the pension issues and say it's unsustainable. We, we've certainly seen, and I think it's 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 interesting to just look back a couple of years, as as the gentleman from Gasby might 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 reinforce. It was only what three years ago, four years ago, that states were required to even report the liabilities that they had for what they call OPEB, other post-employment benefits. Um, so before that, states just they just paid zero attention to it. So the first step was really to begin to account for it, and I think, and what we've seen is that, is that states basically just. They didn't want to deal with it. They thought it wasn't a problem. They paid no attention to it. The two things that are really making it problematic, three things. One is increased liabilities, and not all states have them. Uh, New Jersey does, and a couple other states do, and it is a real problem to do it on an annual basis when you've got you know, multi-billion dollars in liabilities faced with the retirement of the baby boomers, faced with the increase in health care costs, which doesn't seem to be abating anytime soon, and it is creating pressure on state budgets just generally. So you put those three things together, and I think the states, some of the states realize they have a serious problem. We only have two states that have put aside more than 50% of what they owe for health care costs. Um, if you look at the chart on health on trusts that were set up by states, there was a, a there was a little sort of pop in activity right after the GASB requirement that states start reporting them. I think about seven or eight states set up trust funds. Not all of them put anything in those trust funds. So I, I think you know growing awareness, I think some understanding, but but it hasn't been it, it's not been an easy time for states to really deal with this. It's still sitting out there. A, a couple of data points on this. I, I believe New York City has begun to set aside some money on this. And, um, and, and also, for New Jersey historians, um, uh, New Jersey used to set aside money, um, and, and then through a series of, uh, uh, shall we say, audibles at the line of scrimmage, uh, moved away from that um, into a pay-as-you-go paradigm, um, I think sometime in the early 2000s. Um, a little bit before. A little bit before, but certainly not under Rich Keevy's um, leadership. Under Governor Kane and Governor Florio, money was put in to build up. Yes, so so let, let the record reflect. And then uh, it disappeared. <laughs> but um, can I just say, um, if you don't mind, I, I want to recognize uh, the fact that we've been honored to be joined by the Assembly Speaker. Um, uh, you know, Madam, thank you for, for your participation here today, and I want to also thank you for your leadership on pensions and health benefits reform. Um, we are all very, very grateful for your contributions. Gentlemen, stand Well, um, at, at the state level, um, again, I have to point out that um, we are now living under a statutory framework that has us increasing the state's pension contributions by um, one seventh in each of the next seven years to, until we reach a full contribution level. Um, so that's the commitment at the state level approved by the governor, passed by the legislature, and I think, I think uh, we're moving forward on that. The, at the local level, I would point out, um, and, and uh, because you very generously did not point out, um, that you know, many of the local, the local systems are, frankly, better off um, than, than the state systems, um, and that's a, a, by virtue of the fact that the, uh, the local systems, with some exceptions, have essentially been paying um, their our, uh, contributions uh, all along. There was a period of a few years when the state authorized localities to, um, to, 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 to take essentially, what was it, a, a holiday? They called it a holiday. Um, and, and some localities availed themselves of that opportunity. Uh, others did not, um, nevertheless. So, so we still have that to deal with. But, but essentially, the, state, the local systems are a little bit better off from a funding perspective than, than the state systems, um, which means that the local systems will have autonomy, as I've described under the, uh, the TFR mechanism, sooner um, than some of the, the state systems, which is, I think, should be welcome news. We believe that the, um, 
the, the range of reforms um, with respect to both pensions and health benefits um, will um, provide significant relief to local uh, governments and local uh, property taxpayers. Um, I showed a, a, just a, an example uh, of, of how just by virtue of the reforms themselves and the the fact that when those those reforms are washed through the actuarial analysis, our projection is that Newark will be um, required or will be able to realize about a half million dollar uh, savings just by virtue of uh, having adopted uh, these reforms. And I think that's 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 nothing to sneeze at. Um, and we would expect Newark um, and other localities will benefit under the health benefits reforms um, a a as well uh, going forward, especially once we. Um, get into the phase-in period in a meaningful in a meaningful way. I don't know if I've comprehensively addressed your question, but we're we're aware of the you know there are distinctions between the state and local government. We also uh, are aware of the fact that um, you know there's a warp and a woof here. There's 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 state aid uh, going to the localities, and then there are contributions being made um, uh, from from funds at the local level toward health benefits and. Pension. So, uh, to, to my mind, I mean, I think the correct way to view it is that I tend to view it as a kind of an integrated system. State and local government really ought to be kind of conceptually one system uh, because localities are, after all, creatures of the state. Yes, sir. Well, the, 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 the TFR concept applies to, to pensions. On the health benefits Not side, the yeah, on the health benefits side, um, the you know, Newark and, and other uh, local governments um, will be phasing into this um, contribution um, uh, structure that has paying has local employees paying on a percentage of um, uh, the premium premium share. Um, and I, again, I don't think that many uh, local employees or state employees will see much of a difference in the first year because um, the phase in is fairly. Uh, modest um, at, at, the, at the beginning. The, um, I'm not really qualified to speak to the question of, of monitoring of the city by the state. Um, that is actually not under the purview of, of my department. Um, there is a uh, Department of Consumer uh, Community Affairs with a local government division that oversees um, state aid and, and, and oversight of, of localities and uh, that's just a different division so I haven't been intimately involved in the discussions with respect to Newark or any other locality from that perspective I'm sorry but I, I wish I could give you more information okay. yes, sir. first of all I mean no one is saying that these aren't profound changes uh, uh, you know the fact is employees will be paying more than they're now currently paying for health care um, but if I could be a little bit um, uh, uh, blunt, um, that's the reality of what most private and public sector employees are facing right across the country. And, um, and in fact, even after these reforms, um, our public employees will be paying less um, in terms of uh, uh, premium um, than many of their private sector uh, and, and, and indeed many public sector um, the colleagues. For instance, in the federal government, the number is roughly 30 percent. Um, so um, I, I can't, I won't discount an, an, or, or, or dismiss the fact that this will have a dramatic impact on employees. But um, I am, I, you know, I think this is frankly being realistic um, and it's appropriate and it's um, much more sustainable than, than the the, uh, the situation was when we first uh, dealt with it. Um, another observation, um, which is, we very much hope and believe that by aligning the interests of our members with the state as an employer and local governments as employers, that um, that will also help keep uh, health care costs under control over the long run. Um, uh, you know, it's an old sawhorse that if something's free, um, essentially you don't really um, you don't take pains to, um, to 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 be careful with the resource. Um, but 
by aligning the financial interest of the employer and the employee with respect to health care choices, we hope that over time our employees will make um, healthier decisions. Um, they will opt in to things like wellness programs. They will um, take care of themselves, um, make better um, treatment choices um, because it's in their interest to do so. Uh, also, by giving them more plan options, um, we hope that they'll um, optimize um, from their own perspective, from their family's perspective, their, their, not only their coverage, but their health choices within that. So for instance, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I may end up um, enrolling in the high deductible HSA um, a plan um, when it becomes available, because that might be a good choice for, for my family. Um, others um, may, may feel that a, uh, the, the, the more benefit-rich uh, options are more appropriate and um, and will choose to make a higher contributions um, in order to have the security of knowing that they have a more complete level of coverage. But but that's the point. The point is we want people to have skin in the game, um, to take responsibility uh, or at least partial responsibility for their own health care management. Um, and I think that's appropriate and that's at, at least part of the long-term solution with respect to spiraling health care. You know, one thing I would point out just for context, a year ago or so, um, the, the GAO did a study of state and local budgets looking out over the next 50 years, and it was a, it was a very sobering report um, because it showed a widening gap, just assuming no change in policy between revenues coming in, given the economy and the cost of, and the, the amount of spending that states are doing. And absent any changes over the next 50 years, what that report said, state and local governments are going to have to make a 12 percent adjustment every single year, either a 12 percent cut in spending or a 12 per, or it's, uh, you know increase in taxes or cut in spending and the primary driver of that that's 12 percent a year over the next 50 years is health care costs so if the health care cost problem this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg here that you're starting to feel if as a nation we don't get these under control there is going to be increasing pain i think that folks are going to be experiencing in the coming years is there somebody i haven't recognized yet for whatever reason, and, and, and the speaker is here, so I need to be very careful with how I say this, but um, for whatever reason, the legislature elected um, to, to follow a slightly different path, um, and they, um, they accelerated um, some debt service payments from fiscal 13, uh, sorry, from fiscal 12 into fiscal 11, and that amount of uh, acceleration happened to be the exact same amount that um, we would have devoted toward the pensions, and instead the legislature gave us a fiscal um, 12 budget bill that had us paying the contribution in fiscal 12. So um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to drop the most, uh, uh, let me say, the, the most ecumenical perspective I can and say that working with the legislature, we pretty much got there. How about that? Well, you made the payment that was required. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. We, we uh, we certainly did not ignore uh, previous legal analysis, but um, I think the, the appropriate way to characterize it is we updated and modernized our legal analysis in light of, of uh, you know, what, what had happened in the last um, um, few years nationally and, and within New Jersey. And I think um, we're comfortable, and I believe the legislature uh, would agree with us, we're comfortable with our current legal analysis, which is that uh, what we did is lawful and will be sustained. And, and I will say, um, I think the TFR mechanism will prove to be um, uh, an important component of, of, of that, in that um, we were concerned about the idea of, or the, 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 the possible perception that we were just wiping out forever and always um, uh, cost of living adjustments without any recourse to, to, to uh, a flexibility and adjustment in the future. And, and so we, we came up with a mechanism that avoided that and that provides a reasonable uh, 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 path back to having that kind of flexibility. So we think that, that we, we, we think actually that um, even absent the TFR mechanism, we would have been uh, in a strong legal position um, and we're comfortable with the analysis. Anybody else I didn't get? Um, I, I, I think I, I think the time is ripe for a discussion about disability pensions. Um, everybody has seen um, 
recent articles in uh, various newspapers across the state highlighting some alleged abuses of the, um, um, of the system. Um, and, and to me, it, this is very sensitive to me personally because um, I served in, in the New York City Council and the New York City government and where um, this kind of uh, abuse has been rampant for a, a very long time. And I, I, I really don't want to see New Jersey go down the same path. Um, and we have an opportunity now um, to look at these issues without a lot of hysteria and try to, uh, you know, anticipate um, and address these issues now before it gets out of control like it is in, in New York City. Okay, I, th I think we're going to have to call it. You asked a question, right, before? It's not really within, um, it's not, it hasn't been part of this particular conversation, um, and it's certainly not, you know, really within the control of, of, of the state, really. I mean, these are, you're talking about trends that are manifest at a national and international level, um, and it's really one of the major issues of our times. Um, but I, I wouldn't presume to have, you know, much of a role as, as treasurer. Um, I think the, the state health department and the commissioner, you know, might be able to address what's happening locally and, um, uh, you know, we are seeing changes in our insurance markets here in, in New Jersey. Um, but again, I think we're not alone. Uh, this is a national, if not international, issue. Well, please join me in thanking Susan and uh, Andrew for a terrific discussion, particularly for Susan, who came up from Washington last night and stayed over, and for Andrew, who I know has better things to do than to go through this. But I, we appreciate your time taking uh, the effort to come here and chat with us. Thank you. So, okay, next panel is going to come up. Don't go away. We have the managing director of Fitch Rating Agency. We have somebody from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board who can talk about the details of some of the ingredients of the pension projections. We have the director of the Independent Budget Office in New York City who can tell you what's going on there. And Kelly Hatfield, who's the director of PERC, who may be answering some of the questions that were sort of directed up here. Okay, we're going to get going. We're missing Kelly, but we don't need her right away. You have the bios of everybody, so I'm not going to go through a long description, but I'll make a quick introduction, and then each of them will speak for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll have some questions and answers for everybody. Uh, Rich Rayfield, who's going to be our first speaker, is, as the uh, bio points out, is the Group Managing Director for U.S. Public Finance for Fitch Rating. And as you may know, Fitch is one of the three rating agencies that provide a credit rating for state and local governments, and Rich is the major player there at Fitch to do that. We also have Ronnie Lowenstein, who's the director of the Independent Budget Office in New York City. And they, as the name suggests, is independent of the city administration. And uh, it's sort of a, I don't know if this is a proper word, gadfly to review what's going on by the city government's finance. <laughs> Kelly Hatfield, the director of PERC, and she's on her way. Everybody here in, who's New Jersey probably knows what the Public Employee Relations Commission does. And finally, we have... Um, Scott Reeser from the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, and what he has to say, I'm sure, is going to startle some state and local officials, because what they're working on is going to require state and local governments to significantly change the way they report pensions and health benefits. So without further ado, uh, Rich, please. Thanks, Rich. OK, um, I'm going to talk a bit uh, about um, basically give you our view of New Jersey overall as a, as a credit and, and talk about some of the pension and um, he retiree health care funding issues and how that fits into everything. But let me just first um, just kind of uh, just give a quick overview in terms of as a rating agency where we're, uh, our job is basically to assign a long-term uh, credit rating on states and corporations the other entities that borrow. So in terms of for um, in the municipal area, uh, you know, generally it's a very uh, solid uh, uh, credit um, uh, sector, um, and states are really at the you know the top of the food chain there. 
So basically, we have you know four investment grade ratings: triple A, double A, single A, and and triple B. And below that is junk. Um, and the state ratings are um, you know very high up. Um, uh, basically. Um, well, one, one thing I wanted to, before getting into the ratings, we look at basically four major categories in, in doing our assessment. One is the ec economic base and, and the wealth and, and, and vibrancy of the uh, long-term viability of that, uh, the financial operations of, of, the, of a state um, in terms of their how they're balancing their budget and, de and deficits and those things, uh, management, the, the powers that um, that the, the government the the um, uh, the, the as, as management in terms of the powers they have in order to affect um, um, good financial results. And the fourth area is the, uh, the debt and other long-term liabilities such as OPEB and, and, and pension and um, retiree health care, et cetera. So, um, so those, are, those are the four, and that's not in that order necessarily um, of importance, um, but certainly um, the debt and the long-term liabilities is of major importance. Now the ratings are generally um, you know, very high. Most of the state ratings are double A AA or triple A, double uh, A category, triple A categories. Um, and there are two that are below um, that, and that's um, at California at A minus, and state of Illinois at single A. I think there's been a lot of a lot written about those um, two states and for their and reasons for their problems. It's not in, in case of Illinois, it's it is pensions, but it's also just an inability to uh, to um, uh, uh, balance their budgets and and, and they've gone into deep de deficits. California, it's it's a it's a matter of um, f um, not really um, debt and pensions, but rather more in terms of just um, intractable financial problems and limitations and inability to, uh, to reach agreement on, on, on how to solve their problems. That's where the management factor comes in. So in, in the AA and AAA category, though, most of the ratings are AA plus and AAA. Uh, AA is uh, 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 less than amount of states are there, and AA minus, there are only two states at AA minus, Michigan and New Jersey. And um, let me go into some of the reasons why, in terms of why New Jersey's rating is so low um, at this point in time. Um, and I wanted, I'm probably going to talk about this in terms of the context of over the last 10 or 15 years, because New Jersey was a more highly rated state. It was double A plus um, about 10 years ago. Um, first, I hit the strengths. The New Jersey economy is, is, is a you know, very strong fundamental economy, very diversified and broad um, employment base, and, and very wealthy. Uh, number two or number three in the country, depending on which measure you look at in terms of income. It has a very strong centralized management structure through the uh, executive branch, um, um, powers to basically affect uh, a budget balance and, 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 and strong powers over budget management. Um, I'd say in recent years, we've, um, or let's just say more recently looking at things, um, we do think that um, there have been some positive moves of late in terms of, of controlling the growth in spending and, and, and um, over the last couple of years, and I think that's been positive because the trajectory was very, very uh, um, concerning. And for the, I think the pension reform and, and health benefits reform uh, is very significant um, and um, has, has helped um, mitigate some of the, the big concerns we have in those areas. Now, on the negative side of the ledger, um, <clears throat> looking at over the last 10 years, or 15 years for that matter, we've seen basically, um, uh, certainly in the early to mid part of last decade, um, a lot of recurring budget deficits uh, and coming up until, you know, up until even recently, um, a lot, a lot of, uh, of pressures there and the solutions being more one-time stopgap deficit finding, that, those that deficit findings and, and those type of things. And that led to, to um, uh, downgrades in, in um, a few years ago um, uh, for those reasons. Um, we've seen the tax burden rise over the last 10, 15 years. Um, to, to being one of the highest um, in, the, in the country in terms of when you, particularly when you're looking at income taxes and when you're looking at local property taxes. We've seen the debt burden rise um, over the last 10, 15 years. New Jersey used to be a, a lower moderate um, um, debt burden um, and it's now it more than doubled and it's now a high debt burden state. The debt, and I'm talking about the bonded debt, is, is at 8 percent of personal income and um, basically there are three other states that are higher, Massachusetts, Connecticut, in Hawaii, um, so it's um, it's it's and that's and 
pretty much the trajectory over the last 10 years is which uh, particularly notable. Um, their retiree health care costs, OPEB, um, is one of the highest in the country. Um, and it's, it's a you know, very large liability. Um, of note, too, is that, that the state funds um, teacher uh, uh, pension uh, requirements, you know, local um, requirements, as well as, as OPEB. Um, and uh, that's, that's a, a, a fairly um, not so common. Um, and the fifth, of course, is the, uh, the rising unfunded pension liability and the high unfunded pension liability in the state. Now, to break that last category down a little more, um, it's, it's um, the funding level after um, pension reform is about 65% funded, um, and it would have been 56% funded if, if uh, without um, pension reform. So and that's the that's the that's the measure that's the, the measure of the actual funding uh, level of the of the pension funds combined. Um, however, that number is uh, going to, um, if if under the current plan, will fall to about 53%. Uh, by 2018 because of the gradual funding of the actual required contribution. In other words, only making one-seventh of the payment. Um, that burden, by the way, it comes out to the unfunded liability at that funding level, 65 percent, comes out to um, the dollar amount of that on the base is about 8 um, percent of personal income as well. And that's um, certainly um, a lot higher than, than most said states and, and on the, very much on the higher side. Um, so when you look at the overall burdens of these long-term liabilities, OPEB, debt, and pensions, in all three categories, the state is among the highest, um, in some cases the highest in, in the country, um, or, or close to the highest. Uh, but the real focus, and I guess the real, real concerning factor about it, is not so much the level, um, but rather the, uh, the gradual funding of that, that, that actual required contributions. It was mentioned earlier that a lot of states aren't funding, full, haven't fully funded their, their ARC as it's called, um, but um, the, the level that this low and going on for this long, um, but particularly at, you know, at this point in time, um, is, is what is really concerning. When you look at what was actually spent in the budget, this uh, current fiscal year, the uh, contribution at one seventh is about one and a half percent of the budget. At um, if they were to fund the full required contribution, it would be over 11 percent of the budget. That is a huge increment to make up, and um, the concern there is that to build up to that level of funding to get to that um, over the next uh, seven years in an environment of a very um, uh, uh, limited uh, economic growth outlook in general. Um, is, and when, when you're also dealing with um, some very other limit, a lot of other limitations that the state has, such as a um, high tax burden and a high OPEB burden, which will also be growing, um, you know, we're, the rating kind of reflects that concern of, of those type of pressures that are, that are going to come to bear, particularly when the state's dealing with a lot of other things, um, and perhaps more so than other states, such as um, uh, school funding requirements that's back in the courts. Um, um, the need for um, tamping down property taxes uh, as it's, it's it's very high and pretty significant infrastructure needs. So I mean, very bleak picture. But basically, it, it basically that rating really reflects all these pressures that are, that that we see ahead of the state and the difficulty it's going to have in terms of ramping up to this full funding of the pension uh, liability. Um, so that's kind of um, the way you know we're 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 viewing it. Um, if, if you were to, um, you know, add up the, the fixed cost, by the way, of, of potentially of the state, um, if, if you were to f the debt service is about 9 percent of the budget, pension, if they were f funding the full required contribution is 11 percent, and the OPEB um, contribution, the pay-as-you-go contribution this past year was 4 percent. So that's like over 24 percent, and that, that's not an actual n number, the 4 percent, it's, it's, it's pay-as-you-go. So um, it's a pretty high fixed um, cost burden as well. Um, so that's, um, you know, pretty much uh, in a nutshell some of the, uh, um, you know, the, the concerns we have. Just to, just to give you a few other comparisons, um, so, so I mentioned, uh, you know, to give you the numbers for New Jersey, Connecticut um, is rated double A, um, and they have pretty big challenges as well. Their debt burden is about 9.6 percent compared to New Jersey's 9 percent, I'm sorry, um, 8 percent. Their, um, their OPEB is about 10 percent. It, it's, it's kind of a, I took the middle of the range there, but it's pretty, pretty big. And the pension um, 
unfunded liability, uh, their pension funding levels are pretty low as well, and their unfunded liability is about 10 percent of, of, um, of their personal income. Um, however, um, the shade difference in the rating really reflects the fact that um, Connecticut is funding, uh, fully funding their annual required contribution now, and um, their tax burden is, is certainly a lot um, less than here. Um, so that's that's one of the comparisons. So so there are others that are that you know have similar um, burdens, uh, but I think the, the, the big ingredient is the is the um, is the uh, gradual funding of the, of the pension contribution. Give you another example is Kentucky, which is rated double A, but it has a negative outlook, and they're they're pretty problematic. Their debt is lower. That was six percent of personal income, and again when when I when I said the um, that that debt burden. Um, Roughly three or four percent is, is roughly the average for, for for the states. So, so New Jersey at eight percent is, is about double. Uh, but so Kentucky, six percent of personal income um, is their unfunded liability. Um, their pension, um, un, um, I'm sorry, that's their debt burden. Their pension unfunded liability is by 11.5 percent, and their OPEB is high, 11 percent, um, and they're funding their um, arc over 15 years. So we have the negative outlook on that rating as well at, at this point, and and certainly a concern. So anyway, I just uh, I thought I'd just leave it that to kind of put a little framework in it, and, and we can continue the conversation. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I've never heard IBO described as a gadfly before, but that actually sounds uh, pretty good to me. I mean, we're usually a fiscal monitor or a fiscal watchdog, um, but gadfly actually sounds like a lot more fun, so I'm in. Um, I'm going to make three basic points here, and they're all about New York City. Um, uh, the first is, as I'm sure you understand, um, New York, like every place else, has seen its pension costs skyrocket in recent years. Um, in New York, we're actually beginning to see those pension contributions level off, um, but they're leveling off at an astronomically high level. Um, my second basic point is, yes, the city of New York has made its annually required contributions, but despite that, um, some of our five pension funds fall far short of the 80% healthy funding level, and I'll talk about that. Um, and then I'll talk about some very little notice changes in pensions that happened at the state level in 2009 that at least hold the possibility of reigning in some of the long-term growth. But it's just a possibility, not, not a certainty. And then if time permits, I'll talk a little bit about our retiree health benefit funding. It was good of the treasurer to note that the city of New York had established a fund to begin uh, funding some of these future liabilities. Um, what he didn't say was he'd already begun to draw that fund down for other things. So moving on to pensions. <laughs> uh, first of all, the impact on the city budget. Um, I'll look basically over the last decade or so, and like lots of other places back in 2000, uh, the city of New York enjoyed a historically low pension contribution. Um, that's due to a couple of things. One is really good returns in the mid to late 90s that had us flush. Uh, another reason was a very poorly timed pension restart where the city all at once took all of those big gains of the 90s and, and realized them all at once in order to cut its pension funding level for 2000 down to a minimum. Um, there was no particular reason to do that. The city was in good fiscal shape that year, but um, the, the mayor wanted it anyway. And so we had a very, very low level of funding in 2000. Um, and something else happened at the same time, and I'm sure that these are somehow related. But seeing that the city of New York was barely paying anything into its pension funds, the state of New York, which is the entity that increases or decreases pension contributions, decided that it was time to significantly enhance pensions for city employees, and did so. Uh, so there were a number of so-called pension sweeteners re uh, that were adopted in 2000, spring of 2000. Um, some of the largest of them were permanent cost of living adjustments, uh, reductions in the numbers of years of required contributions, um, more generous calculations of final average salary for police and firefighters, and the list goes on and on. Um, I think it's important to note um, that there's a basic mismatch here. Uh, the state of New York um, legislates changes in pensions. 
because there's a very strong constitutional provision protecting pensions for current employees and retirees, um, what the state typically does is increase pensions for new hires. Um, and that's very attractive politically, um, but it's also attractive for the state because they don't have to pay for it. So the state adopts pension legislation that the city ultimately pays for. And many of these provisions were actually objected to by the administration at the time of the city of New York, um, but went through nonetheless. So we've got a very, very low uh, pension contribution in 2000. So let me talk about the decade from 2001 to 2010. Um, in 2001, our pension contributions totaled $1.2 billion, which was about 3% of the total city budget. A decade later, those contributions increased nearly sixfold, and the total contribution was in excess of 10% of the city budget. There was a really good report by the city's controller that talked about what drove that skyrocketing pension cost. Um, about half of it, 48% of it, was attributable to um, lousy returns, lower than expected pension return, investment returns, uh, uh, was about half of the total increase. Um, but another 40% of it was the benefit enhancements that were adopted in 2000. Um, New York City since then has seen its pension contributions continue to increase. Uh, for the current fiscal year, they're 8.4 billion, or 12.8% of the total city spending or budget. Um, some of that increase is probably artificial because the city has begun budget, in the most recent budget cycle. We have a long-term financial plan. So we budget for the current fiscal year, but for the following three years as well. And the city has built in a billion dollars a year for this year and the next several years in anticipation of changes in actuarial, in actuarial assumptions. It's hard to say. Um, mainly, we've been assuming an 8% rate of return. Um, the betting is that uh, going forward, that rate of return, assumed rate of return, will be lower. And the $1 billion a year is, in theory, more than enough to give us uh, some cushion if that occurs. Um, the good news in all of this is, you know, over the next couple of years, looking out over the financial plan, we're anticipating that those pension costs are going to pretty much level out in the $8.5 billion level. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is they're $8.5 billion, which in a $65 billion budget is a whole lot of money and has obviously crowded out other sorts of spending. Then I wanted to say something about how healthy the city's pension funds are. We've got five of them. Um, unlike lots of other places, including New Jersey and the state of New York in the last couple of years, um, we have been repaying each year our required annual contribution. Um, but despite that, based upon the most recent available data, which is June 2009, a couple of our pension funds fall far short of that 80% level. Um, let me start with the, uh, the good news. Uh, NICERS, which is by far the city's largest pension fund, that's the New York City Employees Retirement System. It's the one that I'm in. Um, it's over 365,000 employees, retirees, and their beneficiaries. Um, their ratio back in June 2009 was 79%. Uh, next was the city's police pension fund. Their ratio, that's about 75,000 employees and retirees. Their ratio was 71%. Um, in 2010, uh, the pension funds, which are in pretty much the same rate of return across all of them, uh, earn very strong returns of about 20%. Which means, uh, certainly for those two funds, you know, with one year of 20% returns, uh, has pushed them up uh, at or above the 80% uh, the funding level. Conversely, uh, the fund that's most poorly funded at this point is the fire pension fund. Um, even though it earned those same 20% um, returns last year and the required contributions were made, um, the funding ratio was 50 per, 50, sorry, 57 percent. Um, and even if you're earning 20 percent in 2010, if your asset base is only 57 percent of your liabilities, it doesn't help you all that much. Um, much of what's driven the problems with the fire pension fund is rising levels of disability. And at this point, the majority of firefighters who are retired are retired on disability 
and disability payments at this point are something on the order of 50, sorry, 75 percent of final average salary, uh, which is, um, you know, not quite double what other retirees are getting. So as more and more firefighters have uh, been defined as disabled, they've been able to earn far higher pensions, and um, that's uh, certainly the proximate cause of the problem there. Um, I don't think very many New Yorkers know this, and there'd certainly be no reason that New Jersey would be following it, but back in 2009, uh, then-Governor Patterson uh, vetoed an annual piece of pension legislation that had been routinely adopted year in and year out by the state legislature that kept police and fire fighters um, from being punted into a new pension tier. I don't know if you use the same terminology in New Jersey, but in New York we have what's called pension tiers. And the older tiers are generally uh, have more expansive benefits than the newer tiers. At some point, legislation was adopted in Albany putting the firefighters and the police in a newer, uh, less generous pension tier. Um, but every year there was legislation up in Albany preventing that transfer from happening. So on paper, they were going to be in a new, less generous tier. But in practice, um, each year you got this annual legislation that kept them where they had been. Um, except uh, Governor Patterson, who um, certainly had a brief but colorful tenure as, as New York State governor, uh, decided to veto the legislation, the legislature couldn't get its act together and override the veto. And so now, um, future firefighter and um, police retirees are going to see significantly lower pension benefits. Um, big impacts all over the place. Um, they have to work more years to get the same sort of pension benefits. They have to contribute over their working lives as opposed to 10 years, which is what I've enjoyed. Um, sharply reduced disability benefits. Um, less favorable rules for computing final average salary. Um, I should say that in New York, uh, for police and fire, final average salary includes overtime and other differentials. And you can understand what that does to payouts. Um, under the new rules, firefighters and police would no longer be allowed to make additional voluntary pension contributions, which they've been doing until now. Um, the reason the voluntary contributions are so lucrative for the retirees is they're guaranteed an 8% rate of return by the city, um, which in the current interest rate environment is, of course, um, a really important benefit. And then finally, if these um, benefits were to hold, um, they would see, upon hitting age 62, they would see their pension benefits from the city reduced uh, in line with increases in their Social Security benefits. Um, all of these are huge changes, um, and the question is whether they'd be allowed to stand over time. I mean, New York City has a very long history of adopting new p pension tiers. I think we're at least pension tier five at this point, maybe more. Um, but over time, in the name of equity across pension tiers, those benefits tend to be restored, again, by the state legislature. And once they're restored, you can't take them away from current retirees or current employees. So, you know, are all of these changes likely to stand? Uh, may, probably not. But even if some of them do, it will change the pension landscape significantly. Do I have time to talk about health benefits, or? Oh, sure. Um, our liabilities are huge. Um, last count, uh, the city controller estimated them at $74 billion. Um, in response to that, the city of New York uh, did indeed set up a retiree health benefits trust fund. They deposited a total of $2.5 billion into the trust fund over two years to start building up a balance and also to look good for the rating, rating agencies. Um, since then, um, the city has begun to draw some of those deposits down. So they've taken, as of this year, a total of $1.1 billion of them out. Um, we'll see what happens going forward. Um, 
But the last thing I should say about all of this is, from the viewpoint of the city, there's a huge difference between the health benefits and the pension benefits. Uh, the pension benefits do benefit from a strong, particularly if you're an employee or a retiree, from a strong constitutional guarantee that they're not going to be eroded. That's not true of the health benefits. And it will be interesting to see how those neg negotiations proceed. Um, right now, nearly all of the city's major unions are working without contracts. And there's very little incentive for the unions to negotiate contracts with the current administration. Um, once there's a new administration, and I expect that to happen, um, even though term limits was extended once, it will be interesting to see to what extent those health benefits are on the table. And I think that's an important difference to note. Thank you. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Hatfield. I'm the current chair and member of the Public Employment Relations Commission. Dean Holzer, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity today. And prof distinguished Professor Keevy, thank, <laughs> thank you for the invite. Um, I thought we would get started. So, while some of you may know what the Public Employment Relations Commission does, known as PER, some of you may not know. Um, we are an independent, neutral, New Jersey State Administrative Agency. We administer the New Jersey Employer Employees Relations Act. And our mission under that act is to promote harmonious labor relations while resolving various labor relations issues that involve public employers, public employees, and the unions that represent their members. Those issues include items such as representation matters, scope negotiations, unfair labor practices, mediation, fact-finding, and arbitration. There are approximately, now doesn't that, oh, no. yeah. There are approximately 3,500 negotiating units in the state. That's a lot. <laughs> We're busy. They represent over 425,000 active public employees who work for approximately 1,700 public employers. Our jurisdiction includes employers and employees of the state of New Jersey, counties, municipalities, local public schools, charter schools, public colleges and universities, and some autonomous agencies, authorities, boards, and commissions. I was asked to talk today a little bit about labor relations and the impact that the new reform act will have on it, but that's just one piece of what's going on right now in New Jersey. So I thought I would broaden it because there's been a lot of reform um, measures adopted by the legislature. But first, let's talk about what the impact the economy most recently has had on labor relations. For our agency, there's a counter-cyclical relationship between the economy and the number of labor dispute petitions that come before us. Simply put, when the economy is bad, our caseload is large. Setting the stage for bargaining in the new economy, we know, and it's no surprise to you, that New Jersey has the highest property taxes in the nation, and so for years the pressure has been on local governing bodies to try to control costs. With unemployment at 9.4%, the state is collecting less tax revenues. In 2010, when the new governor was, came to office, he faced a projected $11 billion budget shortfall, which he balanced that year and the next year. But overall, resources are limited, and they're still limited. 
Also faced with a pension and health care fund liability equally $120 billion. Locally, towns are seeing unprecedented numbers of home foreclosures, an eroding tax base, and significant tax appeals. That plus reduced revenues with fixed increased costs create the perfect storm. Overall, the state, the state of the economy affects all aspects of labor relations with every employment group, be it public or private sector. We find that when there's less money available, there's less flexibility. Often we see conflicting expectations. Managers expect more concessions from the employees, and they want to see lower wage raises, increases. Employees say, managers have been saying that for years that they have no money. They always find those raises, so they expect their raise. Also, the future financial uncertainties affect labor relations. When will the economy rebound? Will we slip into another recession? So what we're seeing today, parties are nervous, and some are opting for shorter contracts, one-year extensions, in hopes that things will turn around. All in all, today's economy makes it more difficult for the parties to settle their differences. They're at the table longer. They're more intransigent, intransigent, and they're refusing to compromise. And it's that continued reluctance to compromise by both sides that increases the frequency of conflict and festering labor disputes. So that keeps us pretty busy. As a matter of fact, we've had the highest number of filings in 15 years. And this slide just shows the trends in two of our larger sectors, grievance arbitration and unfair practices. At the bargaining table, oh, excuse me for a second. I get worked up when I talk about the bargaining table. <laughs> <laughs> at, the, at the bargaining table, the troubled economy dictates a different set of priorities, placing emphasis on preserving and maintaining jobs rather than increasing costs. And we've seen how that's played out in New York State when the unions didn't accept the negotiated settlement between Governor Cuomo and uh, their labor leaders, and now he's sending out, unfortunately, um, pink slips. Today, the bargaining trend is what we could, is known as cooperative spending. And that's where the costs are shared by both the employees and the employers. These changes include things like switching from an independent health plan to perhaps the state's health benefit plan, or making changes in co-pays or deductibles, or making alternate work schedules. We're also seeing, and we certainly have seen this today, that the public is more vocal because they're more informed. There's more data available, there's more information available to them, and they've become more influential than in previous years. Many apply pressure to keep costs at a, me at a minimum. So again, all these factors come together to create the perfect storm for protracted negotiations. And unfortunately, what we see <coughs> is that those contracts that didn't settle six months ago, or maybe a year ago, now they're settling for less. When we look at the education settlement trends, we see that when the economy tanked in 2008, the average settlement numbers were in the 4.5% range. Today, average settlements hover around 2.5%. And we're seeing contracts with zeros. Police and fire bargaining units are experiencing similar trends with both voluntary and interest arbitration awards coming in today between 2 and 2.5%. Two and Recognizing some of the economic realities that I pointed out and the pressure on the parties that they're fading, facing, that includes the taxpayers which is the third leg on the stool, a number of reform measures have been passed by the, by the legislature. 
in an effort to control costs. John Corzine recognized the problem, and in 2007, he negotiated and amended various sections of the state health benefits plan to require state employees to pay 1.5% of their salary towards health insurance. When Governor Christie came to office, he expanded that contribution to include all statewide public employees, including teachers, county officials, local government employees. Later that year, the governor and the legislature agreed to place a 2% cap on the property tax levy with limited ex exceptions, pension, health care costs, capital expenditures, and expenses that would be incurred by disasters or emergencies, just like we had with Irene. And this was clearly an effort to control spending at the local level. Later that year, the legislature passed a bill known as the Police and Fire Public Interest Arbitration Reform Act. And essentially what that law does is it fast tracks the interest arbitration proceedings and it placed a hard 2% cap on salary awards, which mirrors the 2% cap on property tax levy. Most recently, the legislature passed the Pension and the Health Care Reform Act. You know, some of these things have been covered, but I noticed that I have some answers, I think, to some of the questions that were raised in the other um, session, so I'm just going to go through these slides. Um, so what does the reform bill do? Well, on the health care side, it increases the health care contributions, and those contributions will be based on a percentage of the type of coverage that's selected and the employee's base salary. Contributions, and I think this answers the gentleman, uh, the firefighter, contributions are phased in over a four-year period, and once they're fully phased in, the contribution amount then becomes negotiable in the next contract. On the pension side, the Reform Act increases the targeted funding ratio that we heard a lot about today uh, from the current 62 to 88 percent by increasing employees' contributions, updating the formula for retirement eligibility, eliminating COLAs until that target ratio is met, and it mandates pension contributions from the state. Once those targeted ratios um, are reached and the pension funds are considered, all five of them are considered solvent, the legislation creates this plan design committee for each one of the funds. Um, the committees have the authority then to change important features of the plan, such as retirement age, employee contribution levels, future COLAs, provided that the targeted ratio are stable and maintained in the future. Any dispute that arises at these committee levels will come to PERC. So we have established rules recently that sets up a panel of what we're calling super conciliators to help resolve any differences that might, that might bubble up during these discussions. On the health care side, the legislation again creates a joint employee-employer plan design committee for both uh, state employees and for uh, state health benefits uh, recipients and also for teachers who are in the state health uh, benefits program. They're responsible for creating greater choice with more plans, offering at least three levels of coverage and varying the uh, levels of out-of-pocket costs, also a high deductible plan. Again, any disputes that arise, those committees are, are working hard now. Any disputes that should arise in those discussions, that'll come before PERC will appoint a super, a super conciliator. So the results of not only the pension and health benefit uh, reform legislation, but the combination of all the reform measures have and will continue to have a significant impact on labor relations. Looking forward, there's going to be substantial pressures to control costs. The 2% cap on the property taxes 
is going to force municipalities to control spending, and that in itself is going to put more pressure on labor uh, negotiations. The 2% cap on police and fire and just arbitrations award in itself is going to reduce contract settlements. We saw the chart earlier. And we'll set a benchmark, as it has done historically, for other negotiations in those municipalities. The reform will lower health care costs for local governments and schools by increasing employee health care contributions. And the reform hopefully will put retiree benefits on a sustainable path through increased contributions and mandated state contribution to the pension fund. Of course, different constituencies are going to have varying opinions on these reforms. In labor relations ease, you know you've achieved a fair settlement when no one is really happy. The governor and the legislature has compromised and they've adapted to the ever-changing economic conditions we're all facing. So at the end of the day, in the face of all these reforms, I'm confident that the labor relations processes will continue to play a successful and a vital role in the lives of our public employees, those that manage the delivery of services, and the public at large. Thank you. speaker before we have some questions. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Scott Reeser. I'm a project manager with the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, or commonly referred to as GASB. Uh, we're located in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut, and the Governmental Accounting Standards Board is the entity that sets generally accepted accounting principles uh, for state and local governments. Uh, like our sister organization, uh, which gets a lot more play for the private sector, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, or FASB, uh, we're both organizations underneath the uh, Financial Accounting Foundation, a not-for-profit uh, entity. And just to get the legal uh, stuff out of the way, uh, everything I say today is my personal view and not those of the board, which only sets standards after uh, extreme due diligence. I guess if I just click or hit the arrow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Real quickly today, I was asked to talk about uh, the changes that the Governmental Accounting Standards Board is proposing for pension uh, uh, financial reporting. Uh, I'll just be talking about pensions, not OPEB. Uh, there is a similar project on the GASB's technical agenda to address OPEB, but as Susan said earlier today, the standards for OPEB right now have only been around for four or five years. So once these pension standards, uh, the board has deliberated and issued these standards, the board is then going to turn around and look at the same issues for the current financial reporting for other post-employment benefits and look at the changes that were made for pensions and see those changes that should be also incorporated in the OPEB uh, accounting. Uh, but to start with today, I want to talk about some simple things because I know most of us here aren't accountants. Uh, so kind of what the financial reporting is now uh, for pensions, both on the balance sheet and the income statement. And then what the uh, board has proposed uh, through the exposure drafts they've recently issued uh, for pension and financial reporting uh, into the future. Uh, to start with, uh, we'll talk about the standards now. Uh, and uh, they're commonly referred to as funding-friendly standards. Uh, the liability that's recorded, if a liability is recorded on a government's balance sheet, uh, is the difference between the payment the government was supposed to make in relation to the annual required contribution in the ARC and the pay contribution that was actually made by the government. So therefore, if a government made the ARC contribution each year, they would not be recording a liability on their balance sheet, uh, and that annual required contribution amount would be their pension expense uh, during the year. Uh, the calculation of the ARC and the uh, total actuarial liability was allowed to be calculating using one of six different actuarial uh, methods uh, and differences, uh, I'm sorry, 
um, the amount of the unfunded actuarial liability and differences between uh, actuarial uh, expectations and actual occurrence were allowed to be amortized over periods of up to 30 years uh, in the calculation of the ARC. So the ARC was not only the service cost that was estimated to be there for the current period for employees, but it also could incur or include up to one thirtieth or more of the unfunded uh, amount that was on the, uh, the actuaries had calculated as of that date. Uh, and then finally, uh, in determining what the unfunded uh, actuarial liability was, the actuarial value of assets could be smoothed, as we've heard uh, speakers talk about today, rather than using fair value uh, changes in market conditions versus what the expected uh, return on the assets could be uh, amortized over uh, up to uh, 30 years, actually, although we rarely see that in practice. So the current project uh, that the board has just issued uh, exposure drafts on actually began as a research agenda item back in January 2006. Uh, the current standards from GASB statement number 27 for pension financial reporting uh, have actually, I believe they were issued in November of 94. Uh, so they've been issued for quite a while. Most governments issued those in the 1997-1998 uh, time frame. And so the board put on their research agenda in beginning of 2006 a project to look and see how well uh, those standards were holding up in the environment. Uh, and after a couple years of research, uh, the project was asked, uh, added to the uh, current agenda in April 2008. Uh, the board then in March of 2009 issued an invitation to comment due process document. Basically an invitation to comment is a document that just says, here's what we see as the pension reporting issues without putting any views of the board out there and asked our constituents to get back to us what they thought was good and bad about current uh, financial reporting. Uh, that was followed by last summer a preliminary views document uh, in which the board did put their views as far as what changes they believe should be made to uh, the pension accounting and financial reporting. And then finally, uh, the, from the feedback we received from constituents on those preliminary views, uh, the board drafted uh, new standards and issued exposure drafts uh, in June of this year. Uh, the comment period was originally to be through September 30th today. However, the board has extended that comment period for another two weeks, so it'll be Friday, October 14th that we're looking to get uh, feedback on those proposals. Uh, and real quickly, what those proposals uh, are based on is the board's uh, continued belief that uh, for financial reporting purposes, uh, pension benefits are a part of the employment exchange that happens annually between a governmental employer and its employee. Uh, it is a result of a long-term relationship. Uh, traditionally, governmental employees work for longer periods of time for their employer than the private sector. Uh, and so, excuse me, uh, that pension benefit is to be looked at over the t entire time frame that the employee is expected to be uh, working for that government. Uh, another key point uh, that the board came up with in these exposure drafts is that the employer's unfunded pension obligation, uh, which the board has defined as total pension liability less net position available for benefits, uh, meets the definition of a liability. Uh, Prior to the issuance of, or at the time of the issuance of GASB Statement 27 and the current pension standards, the board had not yet finished its conceptual framework. Uh, and uh, in the early 2000s, the board finished its conceptual framework with concept statement, uh, as far as elements of the financial statements, with concept statement number four. And in concept statement number four, the board came up with its definition of a liability for governments and in the reexamination of the pension standard. Uh, the board looked at the unfunded actuarial calculation, uh, met that definition. So in the calculation of the unfunded uh, pension obligation, there's basically two factors. There's the asset side and the liability side. Uh, we'll talk about the liability side first. Basically, uh, when actuaries calculate that liability, they project the future benefits that are going to be paid to uh, the employee uh, upon their termination of employment through the time uh, that they no longer receive benefits uh, normally uh, at the time of their death. They then, after projecting those benefits, discount them back 
and then they attribute those benefits to the periods of service that the employee is expected to have, uh, make. Uh, and so in the first part of that projection process, the board determined the following four bullets uh, should be included in that projection. Uh, first, automatic cost of living uh, adjustments or COLAs that are going to be made. If those COLAs are automatic, then they should be figured into those projected benefit payments that the employees expected to receive. Uh, second, the board also felt that there are situations in which ad hoc COLA benefits are substantially the same as automatic COLA benefits. And in those situations, actuaries should also include those projected benefits. Uh, third, projected future salary increases because oftentimes uh, the benefit formula is based on a future salary amount and not the current salary amount. Uh, and finally, future projected service credits or the number of years the employees work, once again, as uh, the benefit formula is often based on uh, the number of years employee uh, worked. Uh, the second part I said after the projection is the discounting back. Uh, we've heard today about uh, some of the discount rates uh, used and uh, the board still determined that the uh, pension benefit is a long-term uh, uh, employment exchange scenario and if a government is putting money away and that money is expected to be available to make pension benefits, then the board said that the government can use their long-term expected rate of return to discount uh, those benefits. Uh, however, if there is a point in time in the future that those benefit or those amounts are not expected to be available to make payments, nor are they available to be invested in a long-term manager ma manner to uh, uh, accumulate those type of returns, then the board said, for those benefits, you need to discount using a high-quality tax-exempt muni bond index uh, of 30 years. Uh, so for some governments, if they're uh, not expected to be able to make their uh, benefit payments in the future, they will not be discounting using just long-term expected rate return. They'll have to come up with a single rate that mixes uh, that long-term expected rate of return uh, with a high-quality muni bond index rate of 30 years. Uh, and then finally, as I said, the last of the three steps is to attribute to certain periods. Uh, as I said, the current standards allow one of six actuarial methods. Uh, the board put forward in the exposure drafts that only entry age normal actuarial cost method would be allowed for that calculation. Uh, the board felt that that actuarial method was the uh, best of the actuarial methods out there to uh, attribute costs over the entire career of the employee's expected service. Uh, so that's kind of the calculation on the liability side. Uh, when we go to the expense side, uh, we still, as with the current standards, service costs and interest on pension liability are going to be included in the current year expense, but there's several other changes. It's not just going to be the ARC payment uh, anymore. Uh, first, any plan changes made and their impact on the total liability uh, will be expensed in the period in which the plan changes are made. Uh, so for an example, if benefits are increased, uh, then the uh, portion of those benefits that are attributed or that increase that's attributed for the past service of the employees are going to be expensed in the current period and then as the employee works their future periods the benefits that are associated with those future periods would be expensed at those times but those benefits that are for past services would be expensed immediately and that would not all, only be for current employees that would be if uh, benefits are increased for retirees once they're retirees those benefits would be expensed immediately as well. Uh, then also, changes in actuarial assumptions and differences between expected and actual actuarial calculations for retirees will be expensed immediately. Uh, the board's concept is that the expense should be in the time period that the employee worked for the government. Uh, that period for retirees is over, so if those projections did not you know, live out or did not come to be, then those amounts should be shown as expense as quickly as possible. However, for current employees, the board believes to some extent, you know, actuaries may miss it high one year, may miss it low the other years, things of that nature. And for current employees, there is a time period they're still remaining to work. So instead of having those amounts back, bounce back and forth, uh, the board determined to uh, amortize those differences over 
uh, period of time. And uh, it's not the 30 years that the current standards have. It's the weighted average service life of your employee workforce. Uh, so that amount probably is quite a bit less because normally we see somewhere in the 25 to 40 years the total uh, career path for a governmental employees. So the current employees, uh, the weighted average would be considerably less than that. Uh, the expected, uh, the discount rate or that return that's expected to be on those long-term investments uh, that amount is, uh, the expected amount is decreases that pension expense amount. Uh, however, uh, as we know, that doesn't always come to fruition. In recent times, that amount's well less than a lot of government's long-term expected rate returns. However, over a period in the late 90s, it was normally higher. Those differences between that expected amount and uh, the actual amount of investment returns only will be amortized over a five-year period. Uh, and then I think I have one more slide. Uh, that was the basically the calculation of liability and the impact on the uh, uh, pension expense. Uh, in the calculation of the net liability, the board came out and said asset smoothing is not uh, going to be uh, considered uh, something they want, and so for the calculation of the net liability, assets will be shown at fair value. So you will calculate your total pension liability based on what we talked about before, and then you will subtract your fair value of your assets as of that day, and you'll come up with your net liability, and that is liability that will be uh, reported uh, on the financial statements. Uh, real quickly, two more points I want to make. The last bullet here uh, is, is kind of one of the biggest uh, points in the entire standards is traditionally cost sharing employers there wasn't no attribution of that liability to all the members uh, in the cost sharing plan. Uh, if a cost sharing employer paid their contractually required amount each year that's what was recorded as the expense and they were done didn't show any liability. Uh, the board felt that cost sharing employers uh, are liable for the future payments they would make if a cost-sharing plan is underfunded. And so, therefore, cost-sharing uh, employers should follow the same standards uh, as single employers. And if they're part of a cost-sharing plan, that cost-sharing plan's uh, net pension liability would be allocated among all the uh, employers in that plan uh, based on their expected uh, future contribution uh, ratios to the uh, cost-sharing plan. And then just real quickly, the final thing on the, the standards is uh, they are proposed to be effective uh, for fiscal years beginning after June 15, 2003 for very large plans that are only for single employers and have no situations in which they have cost-sharing employers or administer cost-sharing plans. Uh, for all other plans, which would be the majority of plans uh, in the nation, the standards are expected to be effective for fiscal years beginning after June 15, 2013. So that would be for fiscal year 2014 uh, year ends. Thank you. In order for you to get down here today, you must pass a multiple choice question <laughs> on the last presentation. Uh, questions and comments? Yeah. Uh, the fact that rates may go up in the future was not for the not only for the service that's being provided there in the future, but it's for those services that have been provided in the past, uh, in which case why that cost-sharing liability is there. And so those uh, payments should not be considered an expense for the current period. They should have been considered expenses of prior periods in which the service was received by the government. Uh, well, I really can't predict what the board will do. It's you know, as a result of the project, uh, the current standards for OPEB reporting are similar to the current standards for pension reporting that I spoke about at the beginning, uh, in which case uh, actuarial required contribution is calculated uh, and the government reports a liability uh, in relation to whether they're making that contribution or not. Uh, the board will be addressing that as part of their project. They expect to begin it after the first of this year. and. Uh, the current schedule is by the end of uh, end of calendar year 2012. Yeah, the end of next year, the board is expected to put out 
uh, exposure drafts on the OPEP uh, liabilities as well. Well, one thing, I think it is correct in terms of New Jersey that the cost sharing is there's a separate um, sub fund or whatever for, for locals because the state is able to disaggregate um, the liabilities, um, in which, by the way, I think it's really very important and a good thing that GASB is um, um, looking to be able to, you know, disaggregate and allocate uh, the obligations. Um, I think to the, to the extent that you are currently paying for in, in, in terms of the payments that the local government's currently making, um, that shouldn't change much. Um, I think what will happen, though, is when the, when the standards change, it's going to um, raise liabilities a bit, and that's going to um, hit everybody. Um, I don't think the, the recording or the change in accounting uh, changes the fact currently. So I think that we will not... Um, you know, take immediate rating action because suddenly the number got bigger. I do think we're going to look to every government we rate, whether it's state or local, and, and in the situation of a local government that's been paying, um, you know, what is your plan to ramp up to to get back to an action to the act to the the new arc, and, and and fund that level. So I think we would, um, you know, see where where things stood at that time and what what um, the plan is to get up there. I think you know, to us, it's it's management's a really important factor and. And um, one's plans to, to, to step up to the obligation, I think, would be more important. In, uh, New Jersey is one of the last states, really, who has not adopted um, uh, GAAP accounting um, in, in their local audits. And um, um, it's very non-transparent. Um, it's actually, it's, it's very different. But um, it's, it's, um, um, I think it, it would be a very good thing for uh, governments to, uh, to convert over. Um, to what's the national norm, and it's been for quite some time. Um. You know, just an observation. Of course, you know, the state government is on generally accepted accounting principles. Local governments, you know, from my experience, has had this issue bounce up every five or ten years, and they keep dismissing it. God knows why. I think there's not been enough push to do it. And... Uh, I suspect they're going to stumble on the way they've been doing it in local governments. Not the correct thing to do, but that's what it is. Yes, yes, ma'am. I, I can't speak specifically or know specifically about um, Union County, but I, I think it is difficult in, in New Jersey to um, um, to decipher um, um, versus other states, um, but you can um, to, to some extent, and and to the extent that there's uncertainty uh, that can be factored into the rating. In, in the case of the AAA, um, it clearly uh, there, there was not enough gray area or there was enough information in, um, being able to find where the money is and the resources and, and how they're doing from year to year in terms of just performance and budget and, 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 and how they're reporting the results um, to, to um, be comfortable with that rating. I'm not sure if I have the individual breakout um, in my notes, but it was consolidated, the, the five major systems. Um, reported by the state to us, um, currently 65% um, in, in, in total going to 53%, assuming I think 3% growth in, in, um, in, in uh, revenues. Uh, the, from our own point of view, we, we don't use the, uh, the stated number. What we've done, and you have it in your, uh, in, on your tables, is we did a, a a uh, major uh, pension study, and we, we basically run through a model where we try to compare everything apples to apples. So we look at all systems at 6, 7, 8 percent. We basically convert, generally look at 7 percent as a return on investment or discount rate um, for all systems, and then we can compare them. Because um, we do feel that 8, 8 and a quarter is, is not um, um, conservative. Um, seven, everyone can argue about what they think the real number is, but we're using 7% for now as a, as a, as a, as a more realistic long-term return. And when you do that, the 65% comes out to roughly 60%. One system's at 59, the other's at 61. So I think, but basically that's, that's 65 in aggregate going down to 53. One thing we didn't do, by the way, is that um, we haven't taken the three, you know, ratios of debt, um, state, you know, pension, 
uh, unfunded liabilities and OPEB and combine them to come up with a, a, another ratio. And the reason for that is because these multi-employer cost-sharing systems, uh, well, these multi-employer systems, it's uh, right now the, the GASB doesn't require the breakout. New Jersey does, I'll say that um, for them. But, um, but there are many, uh, in most states it's basically it's not known or you have to go through a lot of hoops to, to figure it out. We're not so sure we can. We're trying to. So we, so it, it's important to disaggregate. For instance, the, the unfunded liability for New Jersey, I, I mentioned earlier, was 8% overall as a percentage of personal income base. It's how we're commonly measuring things, debt and other long-term liabilities. But if you break out just the state portion, it's 5.7%. But, you know, we're uh, a state administrative agency. And while our responsibility is to enforce the New Jersey Employer Employees Relation Act, um, we're bound by the uh, rules and regs and reform legislation that the administration and the legislature adopts. Um, and very clearly in the interest of when you talk about um, uh, refusal to go to the bargaining table, that was actually pinpointed in the Interest Arbitration Reform Act, where um, the parties, it, there's brand new language in there that says that the parties must bargain and must mediate before they come to interest arbitration. And that one of the part, the party that wants to mediate and negotiate um, can actually file a charge with us. And the law says if they prevail and the other party is not bargaining in good faith, that they get to um, all the costs, there's penalties, all the costs associated with coming before us is charged to that. Right. Well, you know, we when we did this um, pension revamp, we basically just took two variables. Um, and we, I totally recognize that variable you're referring to. And that was the return or investment discount rate and using something lower, and then five years smoothing. Let's just put, let's smooth everybody at five years so we can compare. I spoke up a lot about that very point about salary and wages, and we pursued it a lot. There's only so many variables you can, you know, levelize and, 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 and not, you know, take forever or whatever. But one of the answers to that, I think, is that it's, it's again, it's looking out over a long period of time. And that, you know, while right now we're in a very tough time and, 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 and awards are going to be very low, um, over the long haul, um, you know, if you look back and to, to now, 5% was probably a good number. Going forward, the question is, is that still going to be a good n number when, you know, we're off of the high inflation? Well, maybe we're going to have reinflation five years from now. Who knows? So that's an actual debate type of thing. And the other thing, too, is that this comes to mind with that. Um, so I wouldn't be so quick to, to change that. Um, but the other, the other point, too, is that I, I recall, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, so a long time ago. Um, uh, actuaries that we would meet with and talk and try to learn about this said they use a common, you know, 3% spread between salary and wages and return on investment. And then during the 90s, that's, you know, that, that, that spread to 4%. You know, you saw actuaries, you know, investment fund, you know, 9%, 9.5%, and that spread just kept getting bigger. And it was, you know, real returns did increase in, in the heady days of the 90s and late 80s and all that. Um, they certainly have shrunk now. So. Um, I, I think, you know, as we bring down the, the, the 7 percent, you know, 8 to 7 percent, I mean, you had a 3 percent spread there. So you come down with the 7 percent, maybe, we'll, maybe over time it will go down to 4 percent, depending on what happens, because usually they, they go together. We also saw very big differences in salary and wage assumptions in different parts of the country. And when we kind of, you know, started peeling the onion in different regions and all, because we wanted to try to, you know, do what you're saying, there were reasons for some places having a 5% and some places like in, in the Southwest only having 2%. There's probably a good reason for that New Jersey has had a 5% because it has reflected reality. In other parts of the country, it reflects that reality. So it's really going to be a hard thing to ever really normalize. I don't think you could really do that. But I think the question really is, is, is this the first part where the returns come down and then you're going to see if, if, if the more realistic view of the future is, you know, slower growth and, you know, happy days are not here anymore, that that's going to come down too, you know, just in different places. But I think it's, it's, all, but it's going to be a decision made by, by the actual experts in each region. You know, I don't think the, the actuary's job is also to, to, to question and, and, and make changes to whatever Treasury gives them. But, you know, again, I, I think, you know, a few years ago, uh, you know, we were saying the rewards were 4% just two or three years ago, and a few years before that it was, you know, higher. So I think um, 
you know, I, I think I think it's smart not to change that number all too quickly. Um, but I do think that the changing the uh, interest, the return on investment assumption, even though we've had you know really good returns the last two years through June thirtieth, um, it's hard to envision. Uh, those type of returns, you know, the 8% plus returns going forward when you have low interest rates and, uh, and you know, um, the economic growth that's just probably not going to drive the stock market consistently um, at, at those type of returns. I mean, if, if rates are, if, if long-term rates are going to be this low for a while, you're going to have to have some pretty extraordinary returns in the stock market in order to justify 8%. So, and believe me, a lot of people saying seven is way too high, so... And there's issues with GDP, too, with both. Um, generally speaking, I mean, we've done that with debt, and, and uh, generally speaking, the ratios are more favorable a little bit because the GDP number is a bit higher than, you know, than the personal income tax base. Uh, but, but generally speaking, in our, you know, current um, <coughs> um, um, debt analysis, we use personal income. On the local level, we use property, you know, market value of the property tax base, but I feel the personal income is more reflective of the state's revenue system and, and, and what they collect. Okay, well, thank you to our panel. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, you're dismissed early. Wow. Thanks, Rich. Oh, sure, that's fun. <laughs> sorry. sorry, I got all the questions. Uh, Ronnie, yeah. thank, thank you very you. much. I Kelly, lot. great. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Right, thanks. Scott, thank you very much. Actually, the most important question.